So I think in, in from a career standpoint, you know, like I said, it felt pretty good at first just to have that weight off. Mm -hmm. Then it was like, okay, well, what is it? You know, who am I now? Right. You know, so, and I don't know a hundred percent, you know, where this all leads to, you know, I know I've got the ball rolling again. Let's just kind of see where it leads. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, God's always been pretty good about directing those paths and, and, you know, closing certain doors and opening others. And we'll just see what the next adventure is. Um, so it's not like a see you later guys. Hey, it's been fun. It's more like, you know, I'm shifting gears. Let's see what's next. And we're back. <laughs> this is a big one, man. Do you actually use that clap? Whatever, you're, whatever you're producing. I don't, I don't Ian's know. just going to say yes, because it makes me feel better. Yeah. He's like, I, you, Hey, you I clap with the best of them. <laughs> you do. Uh, no, this is, this is a big podcast for us. Not that they're not like, they're all kind of big, but like we have, we have a big guest. Um, Big and, for us, somebody that we really respect and look up to. Oh, yeah, man. And, you know, uh, I've known this guy for going on a decade now, probably. And, you know, I can still remember the first time that I, I drove up to his property in Iowa and, like, you know, outsteps Bill Winky. And it's like, damn. Like, that's Bill. That's Bill. I, like, I, hey, dude, I've watched you kill a lot of bucks. This is awesome. Yeah. Um, you mm. know, and so for us as bow hunters and as whitetail bow hunters, like, this is, this to me, this is the godfather of who set out to say digital whitetail shows are a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, anybody who's watched, you know, Midwest Whitetail over the last what, 10 or 15 years, probably, mm -hmm. um, you know, has seen Bill and seen the progression of his property. And a lot of changes have happened in the last 12 months for him personally. And I think good things for him. Uh, and I'm excited to, to kind of have him on the show and, and, you know, just kind of see what's been going on with him. And, and uh, yeah, it, it is a really kind of cool thing to have somebody like this on the podcast. And I know that Bill is as passionate about bow hunting whitetails as we are. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that's no knock to us, but that's tough to find. Yeah, no doubt. Well, and one cool thing is that Bill actually has an integral part in our story. It's actually, it's Bill that introduced us. It's crazy, right? Yeah, Bill's the reason that I, I know you, probably in that I work here. A hundred percent. No, and I mean, that, dude, it a hundred, uh, we'll get Bill's take on this too. But, um, yeah, I mean, you had, you had wrote in to be an intern with Midwest Whitetail. They yeah. had this big internship. I was program. seeking out an internship yep. and I wasn't ready to do it yet because I was still in school and uh, I was like, man, I can't just leave school to go, you know, hunt deer with Bill Wink as much as if he asked me, maybe, maybe I would go. Yeah. But, uh, he kind of responded to me in an email and said, Hey, you know, appreciate you reaching out. I don't know if we are quite what you're looking for out of this internship per what you've described. Mm -hmm. He's like, but I've got this guy that works for me. He's pretty much a genius. He's like, you should. Yeah, see, and that's why I like Bill. Uh, you should reach out to him. And I don't know if he was right about the genius part. But well, yeah. I mean, that was probably a stretch. He he probably just didn't want you to write him anymore. Yeah. So, but anyways, that's that's how you and I got. It connected, is. I so. mean, it truly is. Is like he he said, and I remember connecting with you, and I'm like, you know, at that time, I think a lot of what we were doing was like deer grow stuff, mm -hmm. and it was like, yeah, man, like and here's buck advisor. Yeah, here's what we have. Like Stone Road didn't really even exist yet, but we were heading that direction. Bill and I had had several conversations about, hey, do you think is this something that would stick? You know, and here we are seven, eight years later, yeah. you know, it stuck. Um, so yeah, full circle. Let's, let's bring Bill on. Cause I think he'll, I'll, I want to see if he, he probably doesn't recall that story exactly, but I bet he'll recall some of that story. Sure. We got him. I think you're muted there, Bill. You might have to just hit. You got him. Uh, you might be muted, Bill. Here, one sec, Bill. Say something now. I was say whatever you said for the last three, three or four minutes. I didn't hear. So <laughs> that was the point. Yeah. <laughs> well, no. So, so Bill, here, here's an interesting story, and I, I know you've had a ton of um, interns apply over your career for for previous uh, companies that you had. But you know, the reason Jared is sitting across from me right now is he actually applied for an internship with Midwest Whitetail when I was working at Cabela's. And, okay. and yeah. you basically, he, he kind of gave you the down low of like what he was looking for. And you were like, Hey, listen, like, appreciate you writing us. We may not be what you're looking for, but a guy I know and who I work with probably is. And so mm -hmm. you actually pointed Jared in my direction. And that's literally how we connected what eight years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, I hired him as an intern for me <laughs> at that time. Well, I tell you what's kind of interesting about that, and maybe that's the greatest legacy of Midwest Whitetail is just how many people yeah. we put through that intern program. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I think we found full-time jobs for 40 plus people in the hunting industry through that intern program. Wow. So that, that's pretty crazy, really, when you think about it. It was probably, and probably still is with the 41 North guys, the number one entry point for somebody that's looking to get in. Isn't that crazy? Uh, yeah. I mean, because it's- I, I wish we had 100% placement it's on, quite, on people quite a that network. really wanted to. Yeah, it's a tough thing to find. I mean, because, you know, most of those people that are applying for an internship aren't like, oh, you know, we have a videography or photography background. Like, they're just, we love to hunt. We love to be in the outdoors. And this is where we want to be in the industry. And so they're just kind of like, you know, what do I do? Right. And there was nothing to really go through and, and to do at that point in time. So when you guys opened that up, it was just this huge portal for anybody who filmed their own hunts and just loved to be in the woods to say, like, can I make this a career? Yeah. Yeah. We had a massive, uh, every year we'd have a, a, a massive, I don't know what you'd call it, flood mm -hmm. of applications. And we'd have 40 to 50 applications and we'd whittle it down to the three or four that we felt like were the best. So, you know, they'd already, the ones who made the cut, and, and there was a lot of good ones that, you know, unfortunately we couldn't bring in, but the ones who made the cut were already pre-selected. So the companies in the industry realized that, you know, we were doing a lot of the heavy lifting you know, the for, them. Yeah. for them. <laughs> That's so well, crazy. These guys remind. Well, I just appreciated so much that, uh, you know, I figured you guys would get quite a response. And, and you wrote me back within hours of sending, it was just an email that I sent to you. Um, and to get a personal email back from you, I think meant a lot to me. And obviously it's worked out and it's cool to have it come in full circle now. Yeah, it's been a great program. I mean, I loved it when I was doing it. Aaron uh, Warbritton took it over after about four or five years. And then, uh, I had it back again when, when those guys left to start the hunting public, mm -hmm. but that was, I felt like maybe one of the, like I said, one of the best legacies that Midwest Whitetail will have to the hunting industry. Oh, I, I completely agree. Cause I mean, you guys took what three or four, is that really yeah. what, what it was every year? Yeah. So I think it was 40 plus total that yeah. made it through the program and, and they're still doing it with the 41 North yep. uh, side of it. You know, they're the ones that own Midwest Whitetail now. I don't own it anymore. Yeah. Um, so, so they're running that internship. I think they're doing Two different classes every year they're doing a spring and a fall so yeah. it's uh it's still cranking right along well i mean there isn't again there isn't anything like it in the industry you know uh, you know these guys sitting here ian and colton you know we basically set out on a search for kind of that same thing and it's you know it's slim pickings there's not really a good pool because you you don't have to just be good with a camera and technology you got to have a passion for hunting especially if you're going to get up every morning and go sit in a tree stand and, and know how yeah. to edit. Like it's just a whole different persona than like, Oh, you, you know how to run a camera. Great. What do you know about hunting? I think it's a yeah, fair no, question those, too. Uh, being Bill, what are, were, what are you looking for out of the interns? Is he getting 40 or 50 applicants? Is there something that tells you like, man, this guy's gonna, gonna probably make the cut for well, us. To be, to be honest with you, sometimes it's just the way they communicate, you know, to start off because you got to find that initial calling you know, criteria. Mm -hmm. And if they're not using good grammar and they're using texting lingo and it's like, uh, I don't think these guys are serious enough. Um, mm -hmm. We liked, ideally we liked graduated seniors because then when they finished the program, they could get a, a full-time job. Right. You could roll them you over. Know, and, uh, we didn't really want the underclassmen, especially much lower than a junior because there's still a level of maturity that has to take place. Time management skills. Mm -hmm. They've got to be comfortable being away from home, you yep. know, just, all of those skills that you learn by going off to college and figuring it out. Yeah. Um, we didn't want to have to teach that. We wanted to teach them, you know, how to edit video and how to produce, you know, a hunting show basically. Well, I was going to say it's, it, you know, I, I experienced it firsthand being there with Cabela's a lot and, and with those interns and with the staff and bill, like it's a demanding position, you know, it's not like yeah. a lighthearted internship. I mean, you, you get thrown in the fire and, Figure it out quick. <laughs> should, should be hard yeah. though. The best internships yeah. are extremely difficult. We we figured the the best way to do it, and I'm not sure how 41 North does it, but uh, we wouldn't pay anybody at first, mm -hmm. you know, and then they had to show they could contribute. Yeah, we'd start paying them, you know, because I didn't feel like I should pay these guys while I'm teaching them how to do what we do. Right. You know, if if they're a liability and not an asset, why am I actually writing you checks? Exactly. Um, but once they reached a certain point of competency and they could contribute, then the, you know, the tables turned and we started paying them. Mm -hmm. So it was, there was a lot of incentive in there in there for them to do well. Plus they knew the placement was going to be really good at the end of the day if they put their effort in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's how we kind of ran, like I've run Stone Road, at least Jared started as an intern. A lot of our, 
our staff currently that's in even management positions started five, six, seven years ago as an intern. And it's mainly because, listen, at the end of the day, you got to know how I work and I have to know how you work before we get into a monetary relationship. Well, and, and I always felt like it gave us a great opportunity to pick the best ones every year for the projects we had. Yep. So it was kind of like try them before you buy them. You know, I mean, I didn't like the idea of hiring people, you know, cold over the transom without sure. having that sense of what they're going to, you know, their, their culture, you know, how, how are they going to interact with the staff? What are mm-hmm. they going to bring? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, plus interns are usually a little bit more enthusiastic mm-hmm. maybe than somebody that's been doing it for 20 years. Sure. They may not have the level of competency, but they certainly make up for it with the fact that they're going to work 80 hours a week for a little while. Well, we struggle with that even here at Stone Road is like, man, how do we get a better feel for these guys before we just bring them right into a position, especially one uh, like from a leadership standpoint, it's mm-hmm. like we, we need to vet these people on. And it's tougher now that it's all video calls. You're not meeting these people in person. It's like, I think it takes two or three of these video calls at a bare minimum to just understand, um, you know, what they're about, what they're. Mm-hmm. You just have to read them. You know, yeah. you, and you learn to do that. I think kind of like you said, Bill, just from the tone and how the responsiveness is. And you can you can pick out of a crowd who's probably going to succeed in that position and who's going to be a liability. Well, and it comes down to a, a level of professionalism, too. That mm-hmm. You know, you don't see that in a lot of 21, 22 year olds, but we don't want a lot of 21 and 22 year olds. We just want the ones who can you know, manage themselves in a professional way. I think for us to a competency and passion are two ones that are pretty easy to identify and they're, they're, you know, I can, teach, I can teach the other skills. Right. But if you're not passionate about what you do, I can't teach that. Yeah. You know, that's, well, that, that's just it. I mean, it's easy to teach people how to run Premiere Pro and how to push the buttons on a camera, the correct ones, but you can't teach them some of the stuff that their parents taught them when they were growing up. Yep. Yeah. I can do it by the time they get to us. Well, and I mean, so you guys, like, I guess what, what was the amount of employees you had kind of at peak time? You were sitting north of 10, right? No, we had 12, uh, 12 during the, probably the years when you were around yep. uh, and saw what we were doing. They would be seasonal. There was usually four to five full-time year round Midwest white tail employees. Mm-hmm. We'd bring in three to four interns and we had a lot of the, uh, I call them, contracts outside contractors that sure. were posting series for us maybe doing a little bit of work here or there you know outside of the office for us yeah um but the full-time staff was probably never more than five i don't believe yeah but we'd have as many as 11 people in that office oh i know it was pat well i don't think people realize you know even to this date that you guys were more than midwest whitetail and eventually chasing november like if you think about yeah. spring thunder right you think mm-hmm. about the waterfowl series like all these other series that you guys literally were were pulling the levers behind basically yeah yeah and that was i think you know we probably didn't make enough money on some of that stuff because we were creating all the assets doing all the editing and delivering the final product and in many cases we just probably weren't charging enough for that but you know i could pay for my you know the salaries of some of the employees that you know, they did that for half the year and the other half of the year, I basically got them for free, you know, because Cabela's or somebody else Mm -hmm. paid for their salary with that, you know, with that, you know, custom work. And that kind of led, that kind of led you into some of these bigger relationships, you know, and, and even, um, you know, kind of as you were seeing, like, you know, I need to do something else besides Midwest Whitetail, you know, with the level where it was, you know, you had big connections with Cabela's that eventually got acquired by Bass Pro. You had big relationships with Realtree, obviously. You've always had really good relationships with Realtree. And so it kind of yeah. portaled you into some of those those pieces. Yeah. And I think that we had to prove that what we were doing was for real. You right. Know, the audience jumped on it really quick. But mm-hmm. it took the industry a long time before they, they started to figure out what we were doing and why they needed to be doing the same thing. I yep. mean, literally, it took almost 10 years, believe it or not. That's uh, so crazy, man. Look at yeah, look at where audience, we are now, right? The audience was there immediately. And immediately. they just couldn't it recognize the it. Yeah, they it undervalued it forever. so much at the beginning. And, and it's one of those things that it's truly a you were ahead of your time, right? Because you did everything the way it should have been. It's just the industry couldn't, they just didn't appreciate it as much as, you know, tra- transparently, like traditional TV. When I, when I found Midwest Whitetail, I was, I think, uh, probably a junior in college. And I went to school here in, in Pittsburgh. This is around the time that I wrote you, or that would have been right after. 
And uh, I didn't leave my room, I don't think, for like three days. <laughs> like le legit, I was at my, we were renting a house with my buddies in college or whatever. And, and I was, I was really getting into the deer hunting. I was, my, my parents had bought uh, my, my grandparents' farm, you know, and so we've got a decent chunk of ground in Ohio. And so I was starting to really um, explore that, the land management, the running cameras, and I was just falling in love with it. Um, and then I found this series and I was like, what's this, you know, I was just looking for stuff and, and I just got into it. And so I, at that point you were several seasons in and I was like, this is amazing. Like there's nothing else like this. Where, like, where else are you going to watch that stuff on my laptop laying in mm -hmm. you know, my bed or But whatever. it was a different, you were a different audience than the industry was used to. Yeah, and that I think was sure. their, that was their disconnect, right? Is they, they always lean towards who had the money in the pocket mm -hmm. and who was spending, you know, that, no doubt. that 40 plus year old age class. And so everybody that was coming up, that really was this new generation of content consumers who eventually become the actual guys with money in the pocket. Mm -hmm. They just, they couldn't grasp it yet. Uh, and it was impactful for me. Cause what I did then was I was like, I got to go back to the beginning and watch all. So I started at square one and I was like, what is Midwest? And I just watched them all start to finish. And truthfully to this day, I've never really stopped. Like mm -hmm. maybe it's, you know, probably fallen off a little bit in, in recent years. I don't tune in every Monday like I did at one time. Um, but I still go back and, and get caught up and I love to know just what's happening with the brand. And it's, it's had a big yeah, impact on, on me. Yeah. Yeah. And I still, I still watch too, even though I'm not really as attached to it, you know, other than, you know, the, the, historical attachment sure uh, i still just want to follow the stories yeah you know i want to see if jared or josh finally catches up with that deer you know what that buck that drake was hunting you know did he really you know break off one main beam or whatever you know it's just right silly <laughs> little soap opera style stories that get you hooked and, and you feel like i need to know how this ends well that was the key uh, to me bill right that yeah. that was it i mean because you look at traditional yeah. television and it was always a beginning middle and an end to every episode, which really never pulled me into the next airing there, you know, besides sure. like, was it, was it good content? Cool. I'll watch the next episode. Yours set up, you know, it, kind of funny. It is like a soap opera. Like I felt like I need to watch next week's because like what happens, what's the storyline continued. Yeah. And the, and the key is telling a good story. So to tell a good story, you have to tell them what you're going to try next. Mm -hmm. and, and so there was some delivery that we, that we, I would say optimized or, you know, got really good at where we kept that hook out there. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't just say, well, today's my day, you know, or I hunted and then we'll see you some other time. You, you always wanted to leave them with, well, I'm going to try the other side of the field tomorrow because, you know, that's where he's coming out or whatever. So then you, you end up at the end of it thinking, oh, I better come back, you know? So right. you always had to have some little tip that they could learn from some little hook to bring them back to the story. And I felt like if you did those two things, you, know, you had a successful episode. Well, I think that the fact that you guys were uh, pretty close to a real time, um, you know, mm -hmm. series gave you a huge advantage over all of these other TV shows where I'm watching something that happened last October and it's all condensed to a, a 22 minute episode or, or maybe it gets stretched to two, but with Midwest Whitetail, you know, I can go and, and see what happened last week, you know, or a couple of days ago. And, mm -hmm. and even you would say in these episodes, you're like, Hey, it's, it's Thursday. This will probably air on, you know, Monday and here's what happened. And it's like, man, we're a part of this with you. That was really cool. Well, and it got to the point where, and this is where it started to get, you know, even more, uh, time consuming, of course, but we got to, we started doing the daily video blogs. Yep. And I felt like that was the future. Yeah. I so I think that. we had at one time four or five different guys producing dailies, mm -hmm. you know, so at the end of every day of hunting, <laughs> my cameraman would, you know, download all the footage to the computer and put that day's hunt with no music, you know, very little, you know, uh, editing effort into it. Just lay it out in the timeline and export that day's action, mm -hmm. you know, upload it that night, go to bed, get up in the morning, do the same thing again. So yeah. we were posting today's hunts tonight. That's so crazy, and, man. Uh, yeah, that, and that that's was tough. really, I felt like, I thought that was the future. Uh, you know, the, the guys now, I think, are, are maybe falling off that just a little bit because, it really is massively labor intensive, as you can all imagine. Yep. Um, and, and that's part of the reason why I got burned out too, is because it never ended. Never you ends. Know, like, there is no end you know, goal. You couldn't, hunt, you, you couldn't even hunt all day. Yeah. You know, at 11 o'clock, you had to get down and, you know, start that day's project on the computer, you know, do whatever you needed to do because that cameraman was going to be up until midnight otherwise. Right. Bill, I, I don't think that we ever even really discussed it, you know, kind of back in the day when we were working together. But when you kind of, thought about Midwest Whitetail and that start was there something or or some other production from mainstream America or whatever that kind of set you to say like 
this this is what should be done. You know, because we always lag behind in this industry, right? That's no that's no secret. But like you you literally blazed the trail there. So like what what sets you in that direction? You're gonna laugh at it. There's a couple things that that did it. Um, one was I didn't feel like we were refined enough to do a TV show. You know, I wanted to do something. I had some local kids that wanted to do a, like a local public access show. Yeah. And we couldn't figure out how to get on the public access channel. Was that, Drew? Thought, well, was that Drew? Was Drew one of the first yeah. guys? Drew, Drew and Chad. there was a couple of others Chad. Um, that were just neighborhood kids, you know. And <laughs> and uh, I, I said, well, I'll help you guys to get this going. And, and that didn't work. And I thought, well, this is kind of cool, you know. Maybe we'll just do something for the internet instead because we're not good enough to do TV. Um, <laughs> so let's not even try. Uh, but then I was on the, believe it or not, the Matthews website. And there was some hunt posted on there. And I thought that it was yesterday's hunt mm-hmm. when I pulled it up mm-hmm. and I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is so cool. And then I watched it and it was like last year's hunt from that date, mm-hmm. you know? And I was like, Oh, that was a disappointment. So I thought if I was that excited about watching yesterday's hunt, I wonder how many other people would be that excited about watching yesterday's hunt if we produced it. Right. Um, so believe it or not, that's how the whole thing got started. We weren't good enough for TV. And then I, I, I falsely got inspired by something I saw on somebody's website that I thought was, you know, nearly live isn't it so insane like something <laughs> just that small can trigger you you know to be like oh like that's it like that could be it and it's funny know? how that eventually leads to not being too good for tv but just not need it because you eventually left some of those channels to go back to straight digital right yeah we, we did we had a tv show for a while and it was kind of fun you know i shouldn't probably say this but but <laughs> oh we're okay to uh, say whatever we want here. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean like nobody's listening right so right. Just ask. nobody's gonna hear this yeah, uh, yeah but i told my buddy larry kendall one time i said as long as we can win awards you know i'll keep doing the traditional tv um because we could dominate the votes because we had such a strong digital web presence <clears throat> excuse me we could do a call to action on the website and we could get you know thousands of clicks you know to support our our tv show let me so pause kinda, you right there for a second, Bill, because this is yeah. a funny story. So I this is when Bill and I are working together. I'm at Cabela's. Stone Road had just kind of started. So mm-hmm. I'm at SHOT Show, right? Mm-hmm. At SHOT Show at the awards banquet uh, for Sportsman's Channel Awards at that time. And so I remember texting Bill and because, you know, Midwest White Tail usually won an award, right? And I was like, <laughs> hey, man, are you are you like coming in? And he's, you texted me and you're like, yeah, I just landed. I was like, oh, cool. Like, do you want to go out and like go to dinner or something after this? He's like, no, I'm flying out tonight too. Like you literally flew in for the awards and flew out like that night. And I was like, wow. <laughs> like, I'm not a talker. I'm not a talker. <laughs> <laughs> we like sat at a I table wasn't... for an hour and then you're like, all right, I'm going to go I, get this I have one. heard <laughs> tales of you dipping in real quick, grabbing the award and, and <laughs> heading back home to hunt, hunt tomorrow. <laughs> well, and it, it was uh you know, we, we stuffed the ballot box and yeah. then, uh, then they changed the way that the voting took place. Yeah. And that was kind of the beginning of the end for me. Uh, traditional TV has some, some problems with it. Maybe it's getting better now. The whole model might be different, but Doubtful. you know, the sponsors didn't really want to be there that badly. Yeah, you know, right. So they didn't want to pay more. So when the network started saying, well, we need more, you know, for your airtime, you got to pay us more. I thought, you know, I'm going to be in a business where, both sides are going to meet in the middle. Sure. And that gap is going to be how little amount of money I can tolerate yep. and still be in this business. I thought, I don't want to be in a business where I know I'm going to get squeezed in the end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of when we got out of it. And, and like I said, they may have changed that model since, but they haven't. It I mean, it's, work. it's still traditional. I mean, if you look at the end game right now, especially with how prevalent digital is today, you know, this time buy model that's still in place, which we're one of the only industries that that do it in, in the TV market, right? Nobody does time buy stuff, right? The networks are usually paying for high quality shows, not the other way around for spots. And so, you know, when you start to look at that, you know, and especially as the sponsors are appreciating digital and things like that more now, uh, and, and even streaming with OTT and CTV, you know, that what they're willing to pay in a sponsorship today is not even close to what it was 10 years ago. And yet the airtime buys are having the flex a little bit, but they're still pretty prominent for that, that time. You know, so it's like, man, at the end yeah. of the day, how much effort I'm putting in and what little money I'm making is like, it's crazy. Well, yeah, and we, the trend was already in place. And and uh, so I decided to pull Midwest Whitetail off the Sportsman channel. And, you know, we, we had a fair number of conversations, you know, with the guy that was supporting my account. And I said, well, what are you doing to create a future for me there? I mean, 
why would I do that rather than create my own future someplace else? Right. And he said, well, we've got, you know, the My Outdoor TV app. And I said, how is that going to pay me? And he didn't really have an answer. So it was like, you well, know, it, it we isn't. felt <laughs> like, you know, and like I said, I'm sure the model is changing because they mm-hmm. have to, you know, they have to evolve have too. To but evolve. we were on the front end of that. And I thought, well, I can take, I'm going to just not do it. I'm going to do another digital series. Yep. But I've got to be, I don't want to give up those those sponsorship dollars that were paying these companies were paying me to do the TV show. Right. Right. So I had, I had a, a gross revenue number. I didn't want to lose anything off the top line. Mm-hmm. So we created that chasing November, which was an all digital series yep. to replace the, the Midwest side. Whitetail TV show. Yep. So awesome. we took those same dollars that were sponsoring the Midwest Whitetail TV show and said, we're going to do chasing November. We'd like to move you guys onto that. And everybody did. So yep. It worked out good for us because we were able to transition directly off the traditional and jump onto another digital show without losing a dollar. Bill, and, and obviously not to get into like the, the nitty gritty economics of it, but, we, you know, I know for a while there, um, it was probably when, when we met in, in oh, 2010, 11, something like that, you had a player that was unique to your website. Um, mm-hmm. and, and at some point along the lines, you started to embrace, I think YouTube more. Did you ever um, okay. Vimeo Vimeo was what you were using. Yeah. So did you ever look or think, cause I mean, obviously you look at like Aaron and those guys with hunting public now, and, and even a Jeff Sturgis with, with wait till habitat solutions. Have, did you ever think like YouTube could be a source of revenue for you? Or was that just always like a, a gravy on top type of thing? If you know, that was, it became, it became a really strong um, component of our total viewership, yeah. But I never monetized it. That's you know, I didn't what I was want wondering. to put a bunch of ads in there. Um, Interesting. You know, I, we we were up to. I think I asked um, Lee Abraham, one of the owners of it now, and they're mm-hmm. over twenty million views annually now with all the Midwest Whitetail stuff. And I think it was fifteen or sixteen, seventeen million, something like that, when I dropped out. So I mean, there's a fair amount of mm. of, of money we're leaving on the table with YouTube. Yeah. You know, with you know, yeah, I mean, I know those, those views. I know those conversion numbers mainly because I know what what some of these other guys are making on it. You know, and it is it's a significant amount of dollars. But you look yeah. at it purely from a user experience front of yes. we don't need to bombard you with ads. The sponsors are paying, and that's that's how we're going to monetize. That's right, and I don't know if I was right or wrong. I mean, because it's become so acceptable now to just tolerate all those ads and click off them. It's an automatic um, almost I, anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's it's maybe not that big of a deal, but. I just hated that experience myself. And I thought, well, we're, we're already getting paid by yeah. somebody else. Why do we feel like we need to punish this, the viewer by making them watch these ads? I agree with that um, from a viewership standpoint. So, I, I really yeah. enjoyed, especially the Chasing November, the way that you guys approach the advertising. It's kind of- it's, Those custom built type yeah, pieces in there. it's just a yeah. piece of the production that I want to watch. And I think that um, there, there's a lot of guys in the industry that struggle with understanding their business model. And they're like, well, I can get paid by sponsors or I can get paid by the platform for running advertisements over it. And right. Then throw in, and, and I don't know what's the smartest way. I mean, it, it, there's so many different ways to skin the cat. I felt like I needed to respect the viewer over anything else uh, and respect the sponsor over anything else, you know, and then if that meant that I took a little bit of a hit financially, I'd rather do that than just, you know, do too much on the, on the promotion side where the viewer just feels like, you know, we've taken advantage of them. Well, I mean, from Um, our perspective on a digital agency front, my worry is at some point, even something as little as hunting is going to get flagged on YouTube and right demonetized. And, and so if you build an entire business model and your monetary source is that you don't control that. And that's, that's, I couldn't sleep at night if that was the case. Yeah, no, you're right. And, and, uh, you, you need to have a lot of uh, diversification in your platforms. Um, mm-hmm. because the other thing we learned too, and of course we're getting into the business of it. Maybe most people aren't even that interested in what we're talking about, but Um, we found that you're not going to continue to grow organically forever on one platform. Right. Like, you know, I think the hunting public will, they'll flatten out Midwest white tail kind of flattened out. I mean, it's growing still a little bit, you know, maybe 20%, 10% a year, whatever, whatever that number is, but eventually you're going to, your organic growth on each platform is going to flatten out. Mm -hmm. Um, unless they keep bringing in more users, which right. you know, YouTube is really good at that. Yep. So we started looking and say, we're going to get our growth, our viewership growth by moving to additional platforms. Right. So we're just going to go to a different pool of viewers. So we were on like six or seven different platforms, which again is very labor intensive. You know, you wonder mm-hmm. how a guy gets burned out. 
you have you got to research it. You got to figure out what their <laughs> upload yeah. you know criteria is. You got to do that on every single episode. <clears throat> So rather than just uploading once to YouTube and going, oh, that was pretty cool. Now you got to upload six or seven times. Well, and I mean, right? even so, the fact of, of of gathering then all those analytics for your sponsors, because I remember back when, when we were working together, <laughs> you had it all on a single platform you and you were very adamant about that platform because it was like, everything is right here. It's easy for me to pull. It's easy for me to say, hey, sponsors, here's your result. Now it's segmented yeah. all across, which it's the sum of all pieces. But at the end of the day, it's super labor intensive and there nothing is ever apples to apples. Well, and see, and, and here's where, where mistakes were made. And, and um, you know, again, we're getting into the business philosophy, which I think is valuable, but maybe not applicable to very many of our viewers, but the uh, our listeners. But the, uh, the the highest quality views are on the website. Mm hmm. Because you control the entire message there. There's banners. There's other stuff to support it. There's questions and answers there. There's all kinds of ways that you can create this community that really builds around the brands that that are you know giving you money, so to speak, or that you're proud to support. Um, you can build a community there that you control. Yeah, it's um, also the most secure because you own that platform, unlike a YouTube. That's right. It's not going to go away. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got a next action. You you can click to buy. You can do all kinds of stuff because. Really, at the end of the day, what the sponsors really wanted from digital was that, you know, direct sales, yep. full margin off the back of their website. Yeah. You know, and I can't do that on YouTube. They're getting right. millions and millions of impressions, but there's no click to buy there. Yeah. Um, you know, so I was slow to embrace YouTube because I felt like, you know, our value to the sponsors was going to be decreased if we were cannibalized, if we were cannibalizing ourselves by pulling our viewers from the MidwestWhitetail.com website onto the Midwest Whitetail YouTube channel. Right. Because if they came to the MidwestWhitetail.com website, we could do more to create value for our sponsors there than we ever could on YouTube. Yeah. Um, so th th we went down, I won't say we, everybody went down the wrong road. Yeah. Um, somehow we, we, we made it decentralized where you had no control over the next action, no control over driving people to the, to the retail point. Um, so the value that we're able to create per view has gone down, unfortunately, but we got a lot more views. Yep. You know, so that that was kind of why I was so slow in making that move. But the industry forced me to do it because yeah. they didn't they didn't recognize the value of the let's say six million views that we were getting on the website mm -hmm. when they were seeing twelve million views from somebody else somewhere else. I'm yep. like, yeah, but our six million. I mean, we have this is really significant because those people are really close to doing something. Well, think about um, time on site that they're sitting there watching that player, the banners and the different ad creatives that's all around it. Like yeah. the, the other pathways that they can go after completing a view and, and they don't. And, and even to this day, Bill, they still don't from Jared and I's perspective, we work with these manufacturers all the time and they're like, well, so-and-so is giving me a hundred million views on Facebook. And I'm like, yeah, it's three seconds per view. I just, yeah. I think the convenience of watching on something like a YouTube is so hard to compete with. I, yes. I know my natural progression was that I started with the website and I was like, okay, this is where all the videos live. But then once, you know, I would start to get notifications from YouTube, I could, you know, bounce around and watch other videos that I wanted. So from just a content consumption standpoint, I ultimately ended up watching it on YouTube, mm -hmm. um, even to this day. It's a convenience thing. We were, That's why YouTube does we it. We were forced we were forced down that road. I feel like because the sponsors and the industry in general didn't get the fact that once we went down that road, we lost yeah. the power to control next actions for those viewers. It's the whole industry um, at this point. And, and it, it makes me fearful. That is one of the things that always keeps me up at night is like, I look at what these manufacturers investing in and, and I'm thinking, guys, I know you think you're investing in the influencer, the content producer, but that content literally lives on a platform that is not very favorable to our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes me nervous. Yeah. And there's, there are platforms springing up that are more favorable, but mm -hmm. you know, my focus as I get back into this is going to be really building around the billwinky.com website. Yep. And I haven't figured out exactly what I'm going to do there, but I'm going to bring it back again to my original vision, which is, you know, get the people to one point, control the community, control the message. You know, obviously we're not taking advantage of these viewers, right. you know, we're trying to create value for them as well, but this is a place where even if it stays small, I don't need to be huge. I don't need to be across 12 platforms like I was trying to do with Midwest White Tail where you drive yourself crazy chasing your tail. Just keep it small, build it on your terms, let the industry figure it out and embrace that little small piece, you know, and, and the value per click or whatever that comes from that smaller piece rather than trying to be everything to everybody. Yeah. Well, let, that was really, really hard. 
Let's use that as a transition point here, Bill, because, you know, one thing that, uh, well, I think uh, all that is That's super, super interesting. Yeah, it's yeah. the back end of this thing. And, and yeah, maybe some of these people who are just deer hunters don't really care. But listen, at yeah. the end of the day, it's economics and business, right? And, and like these shows that you're watching today, whether it's Midwest Whitetail, whether it's your YouTube channel, whether it's our hunter stuff. At the end of the day, like there's an economics that's driving that business. Anybody that's doing it as a hobby isn't making money, right? Well, mean, it's maybe funny from a perspective of somebody that wants to like hunt for a living, or there used to be that idea is like this is this is the reality. You know, you're you're about as close well, as it gets. Yeah, and, and the, you have to make money. The the viewers when they look at it and they say, "Oh, you're just getting paid." Well, if I'm not getting paid, I can't keep doing this. Right. You know, what I mean, I have to make money. The guys that are doing it for fun. They just don't stick around because it's way too much work. No. They have a family. Their wife says, what are you doing that for? You know, and yeah, the kids are like, hey, dad, I've got a we softball game tomorrow, whatever, you know. We they, see they that and away. it's like, man, they, how can they do this forever? Like eventually. Yeah, I mean, you're not making any money. Eventually you got to make some money. Yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It's a sane lifestyle. I, 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 wouldn't even, I wouldn't even sponsor one that wasn't making money. Yeah, you know, yeah why would you? They're not they're committed. Not gonna be around. Yeah, they're not committed to anything <clears> at that point. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, they, can't, they can't do it. They can't, they can't keep doing this because it's so much work if you're not getting paid. <laughs> so one of the things I always thought was, and I did, I knew this a little bit, Bill, when we first got together, but, um, I learned more as we worked together was your background in, as an author in writing, you know, and I remember mm -hmm. specifically, I don't know what year it was. You, you may remember one of those years you told me you wrote like, was it like 200 plus articles or 300 plus articles in a year? Yeah. 300 plus. I think it would have been like, 98 maybe 99 yeah i mean there was there that's was a insane. ton of magazines out there the internet hadn't really kicked up you know the 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 tv the industry hadn't really started jumping on the tv so a lot of the money that uh manufacturers were spending was with the publications yeah print ads and and native yeah. content and so, in that format and what they what people don't realize is they match up one page of editorial to each page of of uh advertising sales right so if they sell 70 pages of advertising in the magazine, they're going to buy enough articles to support 70 pages of edit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in the heyday, I mean, there were tons of magazines and they were thick, you yeah. know, so they were constantly calling me and, and you know, trying to see, you know, if I had time to do something here or something there. And, you know, I tried to make hay while the sun shined and, and I was trying my very best to support every single opportunity. Yeah. But, you know, that, that gets to be a burnout process too, but it was, it was that was the heyday of, of print was in the I'd say mid to late nineties for the hunting industry. That's why you need so and many interns. The, just put them in a room and say, write like Bill Winky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, did that and there did, were guys that <clears throat> there were guys that did that that used interns to oh, do their, their rough drafts. For yeah. Sure. Did that kind of give you your footing uh a little bit in this industry? I mean, because you think about that, like even at a hundred articles a year, like that's a lot of placement, a lot of visibility on Bill Winky as a name. Yeah, for sure. That's where it all started. You know, I couldn't have done Midwest Whitetail if I had been in the industry already because nobody would have taken a, a risk on that. You know, the the sponsors side, you know, they owed me favors, the companies that said, yeah, we'll give you, you know, I think I started out, it was like $7,500 a year for a sponsorship and I had like 10 of them. Well, by the time I paid somebody and bought a couple of cameras, you know, I made like six grand. <laughs> you know, so it was, it wasn't really that lucrative yeah, for and a while. Pa Pam's know? looking at but you a little crooked at that point thinking, you know, how long are you going to do this, Bill? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that's how it started. It started because these, these companies owed me favors because I'd written, yeah. you know, and supported their products for years in print. That's crazy. I mean, that's such a cool platform to think about on that side. Cause so what was it before then, Bill? I mean, I know you at some point were involved in like doing some land stuff. Um, but I mean, that wasn't necessarily your background. No, no. You, you mean my, my way back background? Yeah. Like way back background. Yeah. Me mechanical engineering. Crazy. Um, so I went to university of Iowa, got a mechanical engineering degree and I worked four years in aerospace, uh, in Michigan. Mm. And, uh, it, you know, th there's an actual interesting story here, I think, <clears throat> for people who wonder what would happen if you know, I just quit my job and my wife and we just traveled until we didn't have any money left. What would that look like? Yeah. And, and I could tell them what one version of that would look like, because that's what we did. Um, so we got married in 1990, quit our jobs. Um, and Pam was a Michigan girl, right? What's that? Pam was a Michigan girl. Yeah. I yeah. met her there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and working there. Um, so we just traveled until and we found little odd jobs and we lived like super cheap. Like we, we literally would sleep in a tent next to the road, you know, or whatever, you know, I mean, it was like, 
how little amount of money can we spend and keep this thing going as long as possible? We got a year and a half out of it. My life savings at that point was 15 grand when we started. And we through that money and, you know, supplementing it with odd jobs, you know, like we worked at uh, High Country Archery for a few months. And that's how I got, you know, I met Greg Tinsley, who was went from there to become the editor of Peterson's yeah. Bow Hunting. You know, so that's how I got started on the writing side. You know, so, I mean, all those little pieces kind of fall back to that that period when, uh, you know, we just kind of winged it and, and said, well, you know, I wonder what would happen if, you know. That's awesome. <laughs> but I got some stories to tell, boy, on some of the people we met and the places we went. And, you know, because if you spend, if you go the obvious route when you're traveling, you're going to spend a lot of money. Right. You know, so you got to go into an area and figure out what do the locals do. Yeah. You know, because the locals, they know how to do everything cheap that the yep. tourists are paying you know, big money for. Exactly. So we would just settle in for a couple of days in different places and just get to know local people in the different shops, you know, or whatever. And next thing you know, people are taking you out like, Hey, there's a really cool hot spring up here. Let's go, you know, or I've got a jet boat, jet boat. If you pay for the gas, you know, I'll run you up there. We'll catch some surgeon or whatever. You know, it was like, we found a way to have great adventures and, 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 uh, not hardly spend any money at all. Uh, oh, you're going to like this one. So there was a, there was a store in Ogden, Utah that was opening. And I can't remember if it was Publix. It was one of the big, you know, grocery, grocery store chains, chains out there. Yeah. And uh, the, in their grand opening, of course, they have those food sample areas, mm -hmm. you know, where you can go through and try the little shrimp thing or whatever. We went through that loop <laughs> about five times. And that was what we ate. <laughs> that was our entire food budget for that day. Was man, man, more public. meatballs. Get more meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny man full of those? that's <laughs> crazy what, what was the objective bill was it just seeking adventure or were you seeking a, like a career in the hunting industry what was the point no i think part of it was just the adventure but also to figure out you know you, you only get to do this one time right i mean right let's say you get married and you buy a house you start cranking out a bunch of kids and stuff you're you know, done then it's, it's too late yeah um so you, you got really one chance if you're gonna you know change canoes you know you you, you better do it early Right. Um, so we were trying to figure out where do we want to live? You know, what, what do we want to do next? You know, you got to see a little bit of what's out there and you getting this guys? Live a little bit. Yeah. yeah life, life, life lessons, here. life lessons. To yeah, the you know, tell, take a note. That's it. I mean, I tell all the interns that yeah. as soon as you guys get done here, don't do anything safe. Yeah. You know, because this is the time to take risk. Yeah. You, you have, take risk you have you no responsibilities nothing. when you're young. I mean, it's just you. And if you're newly married, it's just you and your wife, like, do everything you possibly can, take risk, fail miserably, yeah. and then figure yeah. out what else you want to do. It, that's it. Yeah. You know, you no, don't sure. want to fail when you're established. No, no, because you, you can't afford to then. Exactly. But you can afford to screw up 50 times when you're a kid. Yeah. Col Colton came to work for us. I'd call that a risk. All right. <laughs> <laughs> he might have screwed up 50 times worth right there. Yeah, yeah. he's good. Yeah, he'll figure it out eventually. He's got it. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure he's good. That, I mean, but it is it, it is that adventure. Kind of, and, and I know just from your background – like, uh, I know what every year you and Drew used to take a trip up to the boundary waters and do fishing and that event. So that that's always been in there. In fact, there were certain times where I feel like you were maybe more excited about going to the boundary waters fishing than you were about the upcoming whitetail <laughs> season, you know, just because it was oh, something well, I mean, new and did something to do. Yeah. And there was no camera, you know, you we go. were just us, you yeah. know, hanging out, you know, doing, saying whatever we felt like doing and saying, you know, there was no agenda. Um, and, you know, he would say that too. He'd say, dad, let's never do a fishing show. And I'm like, you're right, son. We're never going to do a fishing show. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that <laughs> crazy though? What we do. I think that's, that's a big point because I mean, there's still to this day, I mean, everybody and their brother has a camera with them and they're hunting and like, there's fun. Like I, I filmed hunts since I was, I don't know, 16 years old. And I love watching back on my dad and I doing those, but there was also no pressure, right? It was just us filming hunts so mm -hmm. that we could watch them back and have fun with them. The moment it becomes a business and becomes work, I mean, it, it's truly stressful, um, to, yeah. to really handle. Yeah. And I, I don't have any, anybody paying me any money right now from the industry. So I can say and do whatever I want to. And it's pretty refreshing. I'm not saying that, you know, I was, I was saying anything that wasn't true. Sure. I had sponsors, you know, but you got to behave a certain way, yeah. you know, like you don't want to embarrass them by <clears throat> being too opinionated about something you know, sure. or whatever. Yeah. No, the only person I'm going to embarrass now is myself and my family, right? I'm not going to embarrass any sponsors. So well, it's kind of I mean, refreshing. You, to... you live to uh, embarrass Drew and Jordan. So, I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's fine, right? They, they're used to it by now. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff I've done that <laughs> I, I, love, associated. I love Drew's reactions just every time. Every time. Like, I was watching the other one where you guys walked up on uh, G4. 
And he's just like, yeah, that's big deer. It was pretty cool. Pretty cool. <laughs> You're like, get over here. Yeah. Look at this. He's like, oh, pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That- no, and, and he was the master of understatement. Um, yeah. But one thing I did and probably was, may have been a mistake, but I made them do their own interviews. You know, like most of the youth hunts you watch, they're, right. they're not very much fun to watch because the dad talks the whole time, right? Yeah. You don't really get that sense of the kid is even a part of this. It's like the dad's deer and the kid was just pulling the trigger. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, so I tried to make sure that those guys did all of the interviews on their on their youth hunts. Mm-hmm. And they didn't really like it that much. You know, so that was probably a mistake on my part. It made for a good video. A lot more fun to watch a youth hunt where the kid is the one that's interacting and not the dad. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, it kind of drove them away from video where there's like, you know, dad, I don't even want to do this if the camera's going to be there. Right. Too much pressure. Well, and that's an interesting camera. thing. Yeah. Cause like my boys are nine and five now. Like we filmed some stuff this year with them killing, they each killed their first deer this year and they enjoy it. But it, again, it's still at that level where like, if I get it on film, great. If I don't, I don't care. Like you shot your first deer. It's awesome. You know, and, and that's my biggest fear is at some point, like, I know that they want to do more, uh, especially my youngest, like he's all about it, but I also want to kind of hold him back. Cause I'm like, listen, you know, once you really are doing this and really are filming this, it's not as like exciting and off the cuff as you might think it is. I, I almost wonder, it seems like, you know, every kid is different and they might take to the camera a different way that, cause I, there's a, they had a kid that started on like Heartland bow hunter and he was real mm-hmm. young and they made him do this stuff. And he seems to have really taken taken to it. to it you know to where he's just he's running the show well, i mean now. even if you look at somebody like taylor drury you know i feel like taylor drury, yeah. drury was kind of forced into it and she's still there and she's still a personality of it and trying to follow in in mark and terry's footsteps on that but yeah. you know it, it it is a different thing because some some kids just don't like it you know they like hunting but that aspect of it being kind of a job is is mm-hmm. not you know attractive to it's interesting because as, as we're going to get into filming you know, I think some, some hunts with, with your boys, mm-hmm. you know, we're talking about taking them turkey hunting in a couple of weeks. It'll be yep. interesting to see. Uh, we definitely don't want to force them in front of a camera, but it, who, who knows? Harlan might want it. He's like, put it on me. Yeah, I think he will. <laughs> I, it's just personality. Cause I feel like Drew's kind of like that. Like Drew was one who, you know, was very mild mannered and just kind of went with the flow type of thing. I feel like Jordan probably was more of an extrovert, um, in terms of when she was doing that stuff. Yeah. And they, but they both kind of, cringed away from having to be quote unquote, the host, you right. know what I'm saying? That was the mistake I think that I made there was, uh, I, I put the burden of carrying the story on them right? because I felt like that was way better for the video than if I carried the story and said, okay, here's the trigger person. You know? Right. So um, they liked going so, hunting with you and being involved, but the moment that they know, had to kind of like be the host of it, it, it shifted it. Yeah. Yeah. So and if you watch those youth hunts, you'll see that the kids did a really good job. Oh, yeah. And they were very good at I it. I remember, like, Flyer Buck and stuff with Drew. And, yeah. 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 I look back at that, and I think, wow, I mean, these kids did a really good job. But it wasn't necessarily because they wanted to do Right. Yeah, they just <laughs> you felt, know, so yeah. That, I think that was a mistake, yeah. Well, and I mean, as they got mm-hmm. older, and especially as both of them got into sports, you know, just like any kid, like, that time becomes a lot thinner. You know, yeah. Priorities and, and change. You can't, you can't expect your kids to love the stuff that you love. They have to love what they love. Right. Yeah. Right. So they still hunt, but they don't, they don't love hunting the way that I did when I was a kid. Right. Well, and I'm sure that's different, even though like, if you look at it, like when you were a kid, there were no cameras. It was Bill out there hunting and, and doing it cause he loved it versus, you know, 20 years later, Bill doing it cause it was paying the bills. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so that's a, that's, that's one thing that I, you know, and, and, Transparently, it's part of watching Drew and Jordan in that scenario that I I'm always a little bit hesitant of how my kids are involved in what we do because it is work for me from a lifestyle standpoint, but I also live to do it and I want them to have that same attraction. And you know, I'm I'm leery of how how much do we do, you know? Yeah, and I think that you know it's always a parental question too on everything, like even sports. You know, like how hard do you push your kids right in the in the things that you can see that they're gifted at. Yeah. You know, I mean, you may see that, that boy, this kid is going to be a really good runner or a really good wrestler or whatever. I need to move them, you know, down the fast track. Well, what if the kid doesn't really love it, you mm-hmm. know, and now your fast track becomes his horror show. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a, uh, so you gotta be really careful in a lot of ways, I think. And I was always pretty good on, on sports with that, but I think on hunting, I pushed them maybe just a little bit too hard on the being in front of the camera part. Well, I think that was probably the pressure of it's a business. It's not a hobby. Yeah. It's not something we're just out there doing. It it literally is, hey, this is supporting the family at, at this point right. in time. 
this is how you guys are going to go to college if this is successful. <laughs> yeah, and that's yeah. a tough thing that, you know, and, and it is because you want that inclusion. And then we see that even with other people like, you know, look at David and Karen, you know, when when uh, yeah. Warren and Easton Anybody were young, kids involved. you know, they were they were heavily involved for a long time. Now that they've kind of grown up, you know, Easton does a little bit. Warren's, you know, uh, involved more than he is. And so it's it's just an interesting situation is kind of how you see these kids come up through the ranks and then, you know, almost that they feel obligated in a way. And you don't want that. I mean, especially in hunting, because the last thing you want in hunting is to feel like it is a job, right? Cause that's right. the worst feeling. Like you want to be excited to be in a tree stand. You want to be, you know, heart pump and leg shaking when you see a big buck or shoot a big buck. You don't want to be like, Oh, great. I'm glad that's off my shoulders. I think some now. of them probably feel like obligation almost to like, it's the family business in essence and they they probably like the hunting aspect mm -hmm. of it but they mm -hmm. might not know anything different they're mm -hmm. like well i need to you know film hunts like mom and dad sure. and step into that role and there's definitely an awkward phase where yeah they either figure it out or they don't mm -hmm. but, yeah so i that's what i would just as a word of caution to not not people that are in the industry because they'll figure it out on their own but just in general you yeah. never push kids in the direction that, that maybe they don't already have a passion. You have to introduce them and let the passion grow. Mm -hmm. And then they become more lifetime, you know, members of, of that activity rather than, you know, feeling this, you know, kickback yeah. that, that yeah. You know, they don't really, it wasn't their thing. You know, it was dad's. Right. Thing. What are you the know, kids into now? Is, is Jordan, Jordan was at Iowa. Is she yeah. done there now? You know, she's still there. She's going to graduate here in about a month or so. Uh, but Did she continue yeah, across she, country? I know she had some injuries. Yeah, she ran, she ran uh, track and cross country here for about a year and a half, I think. And yep. then she kept getting stress fractures. And yep. some of it was, you know, the mileage difference from high school to college. It's crazy. But also it was the biomechanics of how she was running. Mm -hmm. You know, we figured that out later. You know, unfortunately, I wish that their trainers would have figured that out. But, you know, they got so many kids to look at. They can't right. zero in and, and spend, you know, two weeks working on one kid. But yeah. You know, her, her foot contact with the ground was just a little bit funky and it was putting some stresses on her, on her lower leg. And so she was getting stress fractures and she actually had a broken leg. She ran on a broken leg for a month before they finally got the MRI on the right part of her leg to see that it was broken. That sounds like, like your daughter. <laughs> yeah. That's so crazy. She said now her pain threshold is quite a bit higher, which I, I grant that it would yeah. be. Um, mm, but, uh, so no, it was good. But, you know, that's another thing too, is like, you know, doing that division one sports is a, is a business, not necessarily for the kids, but sometimes for the kids, but certainly for the coaches, it's huge. You know, whereas high school sports is more for fun. Yep. You know, it's the same thing again, not everybody's cut out to be a division one athlete no. uh, because it's, it's not the same. And you, you know, I mean, you did it. Yep. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily the, the, for everybody put it that way. Yep. You did it ran in college. You did. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I did cross country. And track. I didn't know that. I kind of forgot you went to college. Right? You have a yeah, I did. Get, I do. <laughs> I actually have two degrees. I was like, wait a minute, college, right? I have a bachelor's and a master's. Wow. And you ran uh, throughout your undergrad. Yeah. Just for a couple of years. I, I kind of got burnt out from it. I, I was always the classic bill and I've had tons Were of you like, any good? talks. I mean, good enough to run. I was a classic. <laughs> was, I was he any good? <laughs> I was a sandbag. I, I was, was a sandbagger. Good. So okay. like it, I I didn't like to train so hard that I burned myself out for competition. Your I know, <laughs> and I probably did. But the, it, Bill and I had this long talk on that. So now I'm into ultras. Jared knows this. Bill, I, I think I was probably starting to do some of those when when we were meeting. But you know, I remember our discussions. It was like, oh yeah, I'm going to go out and run, you know, 10 miles or 14 miles or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And and Bill's telling me the story of like his training, which was I'm going to go out and run a mile as hard as I possibly can out. Mm -hmm. And a mile as hard as I possibly can back. Cause we were talking about cardio fitness and stuff, yeah, you know, and, and saying like, you know, everybody can get to a high level of cardio fitness. You don't have to go out there and run 20 miles. You know, if you literally push yourself as hard as you can for that, like one mile, you could be just as cardio fit as somebody that runs a hundred miles. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it was always, I wish that I, had, I wish I would have had a stopwatch back then because I was still lifting three days a week and running five days a week doing that regimen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would run, and, you know, now we're getting into the weeds on, on, you know, how to train runners, but I would push right up to the lactic threshold, right? It wasn't like, oh, yeah. I wasn't running anaerobically where I was like puffing and puffing and huffing and puffing, but I would go right up to that point where, you know, if I went just a little bit faster, I'm going to crack over from yep. control breathing to just breathing as hard as you can. As hard as you can and not getting the oxygen yeah. flowing. And That's right. Yeah, so I would train yeah. right or not train, but I'd run right at that level. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I just kept getting faster and faster and faster. And, and 
at the end of that like six month period, I thought, now I know how the Olympic runners do it. And that you know, crazy. Prior to that, I'm like, gosh, how do these guys ever get there? Yeah. But, were you doing that you know, bill with? Like, were you doing that with like whitetail hunting specifically in mind, or was that just more a general lifestyle practice? Western hunting back then. Really? Yeah. That's yeah, I did something, a lot of Western hunting during that time. That's what some I was going to huh. ask, Bill, because one of the things that, like, you know, e even since we've known each other, like, I'm I'm used to Bill Winky, the Iowa whitetail guy, right? And mm -hmm. but you've hunted a lot in the West, um, for sure. But it, that was earlier in yeah. in your life. It was during the writing, yeah, in the writing days. And see, once we started having kids, and <clears throat> you know, I had to start. Excuse me. <clears throat> I had to back off a little bit, obviously, of the traveling, you know, to be around right. home more. And then as the kids started getting more and more active, you know, I didn't want to leave. So yep. Midwest Whitetail kind of became the best of both worlds. You know, yeah. I could produce, you know, the the income that we needed. I had the lifestyle that I loved, you know, being hunting. I didn't have to travel to do it, you know. So, you know, I could still, I could believe believe it or not, and you're, kind of, you're not going to believe this, but for three years while producing Midwest Whitetail, I was a full-time, not a head, a full-time football coach also. I remember so, that. I remember you having to leave when I was there several times. You're like, I got to go coach football. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, you know, people would think, oh, you can't coach football and, and have a hunting show. Well, you can if it's all in your own backyard. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, so that, that was the, the motivation for stopping the traveling part, you know, was to be able to do more things. You know, I was on the school board and, you know, other things, you know, where you have to be around. You know, I can't be out in Colorado, you sure. know, when the kids are playing football. Right. Know? So that was, uh, that was what motivated kind of Midwest whitetail and that whole stay at home, you know, hunt the Bill Winky farm sort of agenda. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I didn't So you did quite a bit of Western hunting then. Yeah. Mainly yeah. bow hunting. Yeah. And I wasn't really good at it, um, but I was fit. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's well, super Have critical. you talked to Bill about our mother? No. So we did our first Western hunt. Well, I've done, I killed an elk when I was 16 with my dad, we went out and did an outfit and hunt and, and that was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, but I haven't done anything since until this past year, uh, Jeremy and I just got excited. Um, we've got a friend, uh, from North Dakota that started talking to us actually at ATA about, he's like, man, ev like er there's just big bucks everywhere. Muleys. Yeah. In the Badlands. Yes. In the Badlands. And he okay, just, yep. he got us all hyped up about that hunt to the point where I was like, well, dude, I, you know, let's put in, let's put in <laughs> for that. Yeah. And we thought it was going to be like a four to six year deal. And, uh, so, so we put in and, uh, it was a couple of months later that we got an email. I think we were actually on a call yeah. at, at the time. And I was like, did you just get that email? It's like, yeah, we, we drew. So we, we ended up drawing for North Dakota. They only draw like 780 archery non-resident tags, uh, in North Dakota. It's about 50, 50, yeah. uh, odds for getting drawn there. We found yeah. out after the fact. So I called the state department there and I was like, Hey, there's gotta be some kind of mistake. Like we, we weren't supposed to draw yet. And they're like, no, it's. You know, it's, uh, it's about 50, every, 50. every other year, usually, you and know, unless so, you're lucky. Uh, so we put together this, this big, uh, adventure, you know, and we ended up driving from here in Pennsylvania to, uh, uh, was it Fargo was it Bismarck is Fargo on yeah. the Eastern part of the state. And we picked up uh, an A-frame travel trailer and we pulled that across the state, you know, past Bismarck and all the way to a little town called Marmoth, which is all the way. We're about 30 miles from Montana, S extreme Southwest. Mm -hmm. And yeah. both Jeremy and I ended up killing bucks out there both of our first yeah, public land spot and stock muleys we had know? an absolute blast that was probably the most fun that i had all of last mm -hmm. year but well and that brings up a good point because a close second for me to whitetails is mule deer yeah i killed a lot of really nice mule deer you know never made a big stink about it you know other than in the magazines you know during that during that period but gosh that was all in eastern colorado back in the mid 90s mid yeah. to late 90s and i think that that herd got a little bit beat up uh during the early 2000s but i do think it's you know coming back now but you could go out there even with a bow and spot and stalk or you know sit on an alfalfa field or whatever mm -hmm. and you could kill a 190 plus mule yeah, deer just man. about every year i think this colorado mule deer hunting has gotten a lot of publicity recently it had, from like the string stalker guy very sa it's saturated at this point yeah you know because in yeah. it over the counter and a lot of that area but it is cool man i, yeah. I there's a part of me that really wants to do that high country mule deer because because our in mine was out in the plains i was out in the plains you're out so in the plains very similar to what you guys were probably doing in north yeah. dakota yep just um, rolling heels, looking for basically shadow ledges because it's 95 degrees in September. Well, and we were ending up back at a campground every night. You know, we had a little campground. We had our yep. A-frame trail, and we would just get up in the morning and, and cruise around, and there's, like, there's bucks everywhere. I mean, it's it was it kind of blew our mind in yeah. terms of 
the herd that was out there and stuff. And the fitness was such a big part of that because we yeah, that's both how we got trained a lot. You know, because we didn't know, it, but you know, we just wanted to be able to hoof it, and and really, like I killed mine. I don't know what three hundred yards, four hundred yards yeah, from the vehicle. That was pretty easy. Yeah, it, I mean, it was just we kind of knew where these bucks had been going, and we just made a stock, and it was under a ledge, and I shot it. Jared's we had watched come out of an alfalfa bottom into the canyon, and the only way to get to that point because the alfalfa was private was like three plus miles out and around, and so we like looked at each other and like let's roll. Like you got to go. Yeah. There's no, yeah, we're going. <laughs> it, it turned into a day trip at that point. So we're like, all right, we got to figure out how to get into this piece of public. So we, we basically had, you know, come in from the West, watch these bucks feed from West to East off of an alfalfa field up into a big drainage that we identified as public, just, for, you know, using onyx and stuff. And so we went back to the camper, got all of our stuff for a day trip, um, you know, fueled up and everything went all the way out to the eastern side of this public access and had to go all the way back down to the, to the river most yeah. port yeah to the river and i ended up killing my buck all like we were probably 100 yards from the river mm -hmm. uh, we did stock one other buck on the way down about halfway down or we ran into one and i put two stocks on them and it didn't work out yeah but the one thing Man. we did realize is there's no possible way to carry enough fluids <laughs> to do that stuff. Yeah. Like we were so parched at the end of it. Well, we and I mean, on, we carried a lot of we fluids put on with 10 us. miles today that I killed my buck, probably yeah. three of which was with the buck on our backs on the way mm -hmm. out. Yeah. 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 So much work, <clears throat> but yeah. And people don't realize that on those Western hunts, the limiting factor, a lot of times is just your fitness. Yeah. It it's is. not even your, your ability to think it's no. your ability to move. It's that's a hundred percent. Like I I'm, you know, I, I was in pretty good shape and there were still parts of it where I'm like, all right, like I need a breather here or, you know, just, you know, let me catch my breath or let's hydrate I, dude, or whatever remember, it is. The most impressed that I've been with you, like physically is probably a weird way to put it, but like <laughs> we, we went to this, uh, we, well, we got picked up a lease in Kentucky. Oh, yeah. It was a buddy of yours and we were just trying to branch out. We're like, man, how do we get some more hunting opportunities? Yeah. And so Kentucky had this early season that I was like, that would be really cool to just try, you know, let's try it. And uh, so we went down there in the middle of the summer, like it's hot. There are probably snakes everywhere. Like it's just a, a holler in Kentucky, which if if you've been straight up, it's straight up and it's thick and nasty. And like we didn't have a, a four wheeler or anything. Like our plan, well, we did have a four wheeler, yeah, but, but the roads get there. It was the roads out. were too treacherous. Yeah. There was just no way. And we had a hundred pounds of corn that we wanted to put out in front of a camera. And this was just midsummer. <laughs> and we're like, well, we got to get this corn up this mountain and get this trail camera out. And so I had this little uh, frame pack, like a, yeah, a literally a piece of plan. junk that yeah. I bought when I was 15 or something. Yep. And I was like, well, let's just strap the corn to the frame pack. And it's basically a backpack, right? And uh, <laughs> man, that was the heaviest thing I've ever tried to carry. And I probably, <laughs> I probably got it a few hundred yards up up the yeah. hill there and then jeremy took it over and i knew that he did some running and stuff i was i was so impressed with how i powered that thing it was straight up the hill man i couldn't believe it i was in marathon shape <laughs> at that point though like my 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 heart rate was probably top in 180s but like tugboating I, it right up and we got it there and never got a buck on camera i'm pretty sure <laughs> <laughs> that's how it kind of works yeah. so yeah, it, 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 it's so critical. Uh, and just as a general life thing, like I know, well, I, I hurt my ankle about a month ago when I was running an ultra. And so I've kind of been not active since then. And I'm, first of all, mentality wise, like I'm, I'm just twitching to like start being active and get cardio again. But just, you feel better. Like I feel way more productive when I'm active and I have a good lifestyle, whether I'm sitting at a desk or not. Like I just feel clearer. I feel better about myself. But especially on a hunting stand, but and I don't care if you're white tail hunting or mule deer hunting. Like nobody wants to walk into a stand to be sweating and huffing and puffing. Well, and, dude, I I got real right. into the to the yoga. Yeah, last because we couldn't go to gym, all the gyms were closed, and so I was like, I need to figure yeah. out a way to you know increase my flexibility. I want to have like the endurance, the cardio, and so I got real into yoga last summer, and I that helped me a lot with yeah, the hiking. I'm, aspect. I'm not flexible at all. I yeah. like I can't touch my toes. I'm going to run just for a second, guys. I'm going to run to the bathroom. I drink too much coffee. Here, no, so we'll pause. You know what? You we're hey, gonna... I'm glad you said it because I'm going to do the same yeah, thing. Yeah, we're, we'll post-produce, so we're good. Cool. We'll, okay. pop, we'll I'll stop. be right back. Okay. Okay, so the you know we're talking about Western hunting, you know, and how fitness is so important. And, you know, the one thing I've noticed on whitetail hunting, too, is that the more fit I am, the more aggressively that I hunt. Hmm. Because there are certain things that you know you should do, like, Gosh, that tree stand is not in quite the right spot. I need to move that. I've noticed but you know exactly it's going to take you know an hour and a half of effort, and it's like, eh, 
I just don't have the energy. I'm just yeah. not going to do it. I'll keep hunting that spot, even though it's not perfect. Yep. Or my exit, my exit route really should be, you know, down this valley, swing around the backside of this hill and come out on the road and then walk up the road, you know, rather than going right through the deer back mm-hmm. to my truck, mm-hmm. you're like, ah, I just don't know. I just don't have the energy. I just don't feel it. You know, I'm just going to yep. bump the deer. Hopefully it won't be that bad. Yeah. You know, so I, I really feel like even with whitetail hunting, there are certain things that we know we should do, but if we just are, yeah, you know, lacking the energy, let's say yep. we do it the easy way. And, yeah. and, uh, that, that's usually doesn't work. You know, I mean, you're going to kill deer like that, but you're probably not going to kill consistently the kind of age class of deer that you're after because too many deer get educated when you hunt, you know, uh, with the, the least amount of physical effort, we, put it we, that way. We've seen that a lot firsthand. Just, I mean, just the fact that we are in, you know, pretty good shape is it's, there's no question. Like if there's a buck somewhere and yeah, there's, there's a possibility that we could make a move and get them killed. My buck in North Dakota was a great example of that. Me skipping one off of pretty boys, uh, back in Kansas is an example. My buck in Kansas there's, this year. There's just no question to it. It's like, well, here's what needs done to kill this deer. Yeah, no, we're doing that. We're, we're really big on, on hanging hunts that, I mean, yep. I've killed, there's a deer over Jared's shoulder. Um, I I've killed, I would say most of my big bucks on a first time hanging hunt. Cause I've just waited and waited and waited and it's difficult to get in there, but I take my time, yeah. I hang it, I hunt it. And that first experience is when I kill your it. buck in Kansas this year. Yeah. was a great example. I remember you were just bitching about carrying all that <laughs> stuff into the stand. You're like, dude, I was miserable. I was mad at myself for even trying it. I had all my self film equipment. I had cameras over the shoulder, my big camera that I was filming with, my bow, like I mean everything with me. And I was I, I was late getting into the stand. I was sweating. I get in there and I'm just like, this is stupid. I you remember know? Bill in a, in a bunch of the Midwest Whitetail episodes, you you would make comments like, Well, you know, we're walking in, back into the stand and we've got way more than it feels like two guys should be able to carry, but we're gonna try. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that was you know, I think that was important, you know, during during any successful whitetail season. Yep. to be fit enough that you're not taking the easy route. Yep. And, you know, it, it became, again, the cameraman became somewhat of a limiting factor in the way that I could hunt because you don't want to torture Take no, those Colton. Guys, yeah, right? take no. You best get in physical shape. Yeah, you don't <laughs> want to torture those guys. And I didn't always have guys that were in great physical shape. Some of my cameramen, I, I would say, well, this guy's more like a ground blind cameraman, you know, so we might have spent, <laughs> yeah, you know, you're on ground most blind, of the dude. season. <laughs> yeah, might have spent most of the season hunting out of, out of a ground blind because I look at him, I'm thinking, gosh, you know, I just don't know if this guy's fit enough to, not fit enough, but yeah. is he going to be able to climb some of these trees that I'm going in and out of all the time, you know, daily and, and That's you know, tough, not have this. man. I, I almost, in, in it. I and Colton will find this out this year. Like I just I move into a stand into a spot in a certain way and it's it's uncontrollable when somebody else is moving their own way into that stand with you, but it's just like it 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 agitates me to a point because mm-hmm. I'm just like I'm like why would you step on that stick? Like it's very clear <laughs> that stick's there. You didn't need to step yeah. on it. I do I have the same thing even with Cor- Corey is uh, yeah. a good friend of mine. I filmed a kill a buck off of my farm this year and as close of friends as he and I are, I get like pissed off at him while we're walking to stands. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, yeah. Meanwhile, I'm probably making just as much noise, but I have in my head that like, this is how we're doing yeah. this. So. Yeah. And that's a tough thing. Well, I mean, that makes it difficult <laughs> about filming your own filming hunts yeah. in a period. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, people think, oh, it's probably twice as hard to kill a, a you know, a certain deer with the cameraman. I think it's more like three or four times as hard. Yeah. Yeah, because it was like, we can talk about my season last, last season and it was so easy. You know, well, and maybe yeah. it was just, let's, let's talk about place. that a little bit, Bill. Just so first of all, where are you at? You're, are you in Northeast Iowa now? No, no. Uh, see, that's where my parents are from. That's where okay. most of my extended family is. Okay. So we were in South central. Yep. And the goal was to, uh, get closer to mom and dad, you know, they're yep. both aging and, you know, I, I just don't spend enough time with them. So the whole idea was you know, we're going to move closer to my family. We're going to move closer to Pam's family. Mm -hmm. Um, I can keep the farm or, you know, I could sell it and and try to find something to replace it up where mom and dad are at. Right. Because either way, I'm going to be driving two hours to my hunting place. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to go daily. I'm going to go there for, you know, a week or 10 days and then pop back home again for a couple of days or whatever, you know? So it's, I'm going to spend a lot of time, excuse me, wherever, wherever I own the land. So wouldn't it be better if I owned the land up by mom and dad? Sure. You know, so we sold our farm for that reason with the specific intention of replacing it with something in that area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I grew up there, you know, I'm fourth generation on both sides of my family in that area. 
you know, so I'm related to a lot of people, know a lot of people. And I thought that it wouldn't be that hard, you know, to run down something comparable size or, you know, just a really nice farm to right. call home base, but it just didn't, didn't fall into place. I mean, I had some really good leads on some great farms and I sat down and visited with, you know, various landowners, nothing listed for sale, mm -hmm. but you everything's know, for sale at the end of the day. Bit, <laughs> yeah. yeah it, they, they chose not to sell. Mm -hmm. Um, so I ended up hunting on a piece of property that it was, it was an area where I wanted to buy, but it just didn't come together. Mm -hmm. You know, so I was hunting on, you know, in that area thinking, well, you know, at least I'm, I've had a lot of conversations here. You know, I know what I'm, what I'm into. Um, so it was, it was not permission. I was paying a lease fee, yep. you know, for the property. Uh, but I mean, I could get permission on probably 20,000 acres up there if I wanted to, you know, because of all the people that I'm related to. Right. But I just felt like, you know, that was a good spot, good neighborhood. You know, I wanted to buy there to begin with that didn't work. So, you know, keep my foot in the door. Yeah. Just so that least, was kind of yeah. the, yeah, that was, that was the whole background on, you know, how that all took place and why and what took me to where I ended up last fall. And did you, you guys, did you and Pam buy a house up there then? So we're, we're in, uh, just north of the Iowa City area. Which, so we're in central Iowa. Not yeah. far from so, Jordan then? Yeah, closer. Like yeah. we're about two hours from mom and dad, whereas before we were about four. Yep. You know, so I can run up there for a day now. It's not that big of a deal, you know, whereas before, you know, there was so many projects on the farm, so many things to keep me tied down. You know, Midwest yeah. Whitetail was so time consuming, all the projects, kids activities. You know, so now <clears throat> we kind of have most of that behind us, if not all of it. Mm -hmm. So there's, it's a lot easier for me just to say, I'm going to run up and see mom and dad for a couple of days. Right. You know, and I think that's super important. You know, it, it, you know, maybe in this day and age, people don't respect enough the, the fact that, you know, we do need to honor our parents. Um, Time short, And man. I certainly, I certainly didn't, uh, you know, enough, you know, during the years. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of, <clears throat> excuse me. So that's kind of the motivation behind our lifestyle change, if you want to call it that. Sure. Um, but you know, they're only going to be on the planet for a certain amount of time, you know, and, and, uh, you know, we need to make sure that we're available to, you know, make those years quality. Yeah. And that's hard, man. I mean, I know from, from my standpoint, you know, obviously when we worked together, I lived in Northern Missouri, you know, and, and we made the track halfway back across the country to, to be towards Pittsburgh around my family. And, you know, even today, like, uh, it's probably the same when you were doing a lot of the Midwest white tail stuff, like you're just so busy that, you know, and I, I feel bad about it now looking back. Cause I'm like, man, like I, I should have, like, I feel like I could have made a better effort, but I just was so wrapped up in family and business and everything else that was going on that it was like, yeah, I didn't make it back to hunt with my dad or, or see my mom as much as I wanted to, you know, and now, especially after this whole pandemic thing, you know, it's kind of like, all right, you know, life can slow down. It'll still be there, you know, whether I take a day and do that or not. Yeah. Yeah. And my dad, <clears throat> excuse me, my dad said, uh, kind of made me feel bad this past fall. He said, gosh, we've seen you more this year than we've seen you in the last 10 years combined. I'm like, Oh yeah, I get you. <laughs> you know, and I know he wasn't saying it, you know, to right, try to make yeah. me feel bad, but it did make me feel bad. Yeah. Well, and again, it goes back to the fact like you're running a business, you know, and, and especially when you're your own proprietor, you know, it, <laughs> it takes every bit that you have, you know, and because the, when you're taking off, you're not necessarily making money. Um, that's right. You know, and that's a, that's a tough thing to balance, <laughs> you know, ultimately, but it's just tough to make it a priority. I think, my, you know, yeah. my situation has been cool because e even though I'm maybe wrongly placing a priority on, on hunting over just setting time aside from family, it's worked out that where I do most of my hunting is at my family farm. And so, uh, whether I want to see them or not, every time I go to hunt, which is quite a bit, you know, mom's there with a, a hot meal waiting for us. And, and dad always wants to go and check trail cameras. So yeah. I've really enjoyed that, that time with them here recently. So that's what I'm trying to do is to replace, you know, the farm in Southern Iowa with one right, you know, near mom and dad, <clears throat> you know, I'll continue to look for, for land, but I'm starting to lose a little bit of hope of, of, you know, anything happening anytime soon. So the, I guess the lease piece that you found, Bill, um, so how big is it? 500 acres. Okay. And so you're familiar with the area you get on and this is kind of a cool thing. I think this is where people are really going to get interested is like, what do you do first? Like you find, well, you got the, 500 acres. What do you do first? <laughs> well, see the, the, the beauty of it is I've had it when I was a kid, uh, I had permission on 60 some different properties, believe it or not up there for whitetail. Wow. And, uh, so I had, I had access to much of that area before, but that was 30 years ago, you mm -hmm. know, so. 
Was that a I thing the then, Bill? Was that was permission something that was required? Or because I know my uncle talks to me about even 20, 30 years ago. He's like, there was no permission. He's like, just nobody cared. You could go and hunt anywhere. Well, yeah, you still I still had permission, but I was like 61 for 62. I'm getting permission. You know, I had only one person. A little better than Weston's odds. Yeah, Weston was like <laughs> 0 for 25. 0 for 25. I said yeah. you better work on your sales pitch, dude. <laughs> yeah. No, times have changed for sure, but yeah. You know, I still had permission on all of those 61 different farms or whatever it was, you know, but the, uh, so I knew the terrain, I knew how to hunt the terrain. Mm -hmm. The only thing I didn't know was, uh, what deer are here. Right. You know? And so the first thing was obviously to get the trail cameras out and figure out what was there, you know, what, what was a realistic expectation of, you know, the type of deer that I could be hunting there, you know, which part of the property are the deer that are more, more interesting spending most of their time. Yep. Same thing I was doing on the property that I sold. Yep. I, I think it's an, a super interesting, uh, j- just thing to notice here is that I, I'm kind of a firm believer that proximity to the area that you hunt is what kills deer. And maybe it's not proximity as much as it is like most recent information. Like mm-hmm. I, I kind of have this belief that like, <clears throat> man, there's no excuse for my dad not to be killing a, a buck off of our farm every single year. He lives there. He's driving these roads. You can see mm-hmm. all these fields every night. And so I feel like I'm kind of at a huge disadvantage being even just two hours away and mm-hmm. being the one running all the, you know, we run cell cameras and stuff. I still think he has a huge advantage just living there. Are you, are you running standard cameras or cell cameras, Bill? Just standard ones. Yeah. So I was making the trip up every three days. Mm-hmm. And again, that was really good because every time I went up, I got to see mom and dad. Right. Yep. There you go. So it was, it was just a really good excuse, you know, to, uh, mm-hmm. to see them, yep. you know, if nothing else. Uh, so no, I was running, uh, I think I had 10, eight or 10 cameras and, and I didn't try to cover the whole farm. You know, you have to be careful on where you put cameras and sure. so Access, I was putting them only yeah. in the spots that I could, you know, check them without impacting the deer and, I'd go in there with an ATV and, you know, slide from camera to camera. And, and, uh, you know, I've got my own system of, of keen and the, the inventory and, and my own thoughts on when you need to run cameras and when you don't and stuff like that. So I just fell into the same things that I'd learned over the years on the farm that we sold and just did it there. Yeah. Um, That's an interesting was, piece, really Bill. Surprised. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit? Cause I know that was one <laughs> thing that when, when I was working with you, I always thought was interesting. Like I'm a, I, really, I'm a year round guy when it comes to cameras, I've got cell cameras running right now for Turkey, for the kids in some cases, but I also want to see, you know, all bucks have dropped. What are they growing? I know for a while there, you were very heavy on preseason cameras, but when the season started, you didn't, you didn't run anything. Yeah. Still, still the same. That and it's not necessarily crazy. when the season, just to let you know, it's uh, when, <laughs> You've, you've got to get them through that fall transition. Yeah. You know, they, they disperse from their summer range to their fall range. Yep. And there's a period of time there when that dispersal is taking place. And uh, that's what you're trying to get your hands on is not necessarily, you know, again, the year round stuff is fun, but <clears throat> it takes time. It takes energy. You know, I don't need to be white tailed deer 100% of the time, every single day of my life. Sure. You know, so there's a certain period of the year where you're like, I just don't even want to really think about it that much. I want to, you know, coach track or I want to go do something else for a little while, keep this fresh. Right. So I wasn't a year around camera guy, but it's critical to know where they're going to be during the fall. Mm-hmm. Um, so roughly when they start shedding their velvet and they disperse from their, their uh, bachelor groups, that's the beginning of the time when I start running camera. So maybe about the 10th of camera September, first. they've started, started that transition into their fall ranges. Mm-hmm. And then about the 15th of October, that transition is pretty much over. So you got about a month where those bucks are, you know, spreading back out and, and, and settling into their fall ranges. And I don't want to know, and, and everybody's got their own ideas. I don't want to know day by day where the deer I'm after is, you know, I still want there to be that little element of surprise, mm-hmm. you know, something where I don't have him perfectly pegged because right. I don't want to make it where it's, it's almost too easy. Mm-hmm. You know, you just want to know generally where he lives. Then you want to depend a little bit more on woodsmanship, a little bit more on, you know, trying to figure out where would he probably go through. You know, I don't want to have a cell camera on that spot telling me that he's going through there. Sure. I still want to have that element of surprise of, of you know, not quite knowing 100% if I've got this right. Um, but like I said, everybody's got their own their own goals. You know, some guys hunt with recurves. You know, some yep. guys hunt with you know, guns and not bows. Yep. Everybody has their own level. And that's the beauty of hunting. You get to pick, pick you out know, where you how want deep be. you go. Um, so anyway, that's, that's, that's how I was doing it and, and still do it. Um, so I'm not a year round guy. The only time I was ever 
really running cameras a lot during the late, late was to try to uh, figure out when a certain buck shed so we could run in there and get his antlers um, mm-hmm. you know, before the squirrels got him. Yeah, but, right. Mm-hmm. You know, other than that. Do, do you feel, Bill, you know, like you ever kind of went down that road a little further to the point where you're like, eh, I don't know if I quite enjoyed that and then backed off to how you're running them now? I don't, I don't think so. I was more of a reluctant camera guy. Uh, and, and you're going to laugh at me. I mean, I could have killed a lot more bigger deer, I'm sure, early you know, in, in my hunting career, if I'd embraced the cameras more, I started doing it because Midwest Whitetail required more content. We had right. to have stories to tell, right? Yep. We couldn't just show up and go deer hunting. Mm-hmm. So we had to start picking individual deer. We had to start saying, okay, this is the buck I'm after. Here's the trail cam pictures of him. You know, he's living in this area. We needed to be able to teach. Yeah. And yeah. we couldn't teach without information. So mm-hmm. that required, you know, so the, the Midwest Whitetail in some ways made me a lot better deer hunter from an effectiveness standpoint, because it forced me to sure. learn enough to teach it. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. So, yeah. So that was kind of when it really started. So I never really got so deep into the trail cameras that I backed off from it. I was always just, I mean, they're great tools, probably the number one most, you know, compelling tool that yep. we have other than our bows. Right. But, you know, I was only pushing in as far as I felt like I had to, Yeah. You know, r- rather than I didn't want to make the hunt too, I'm not saying these deer are ever programmable. They certainly aren't. Well, almost too staged to a point. Yeah. Right. You know, too much, you know, yep. too much. Yeah. And I think yeah. for Jared and I, where we've really kind of evolved and, and spreading out, and this is another thing I want to get into with you, but you know, for us, it's, you have to know that a buck that you want to harvest is there. Otherwise you That's spend it. so much time hunting a deer that literally is a ghost. And I know you've had several of those, you know, even through yeah. Midwest whitetail on your own farm where it's like, man, am I, am I literally hunting a ghost here? Like, does this deer even, is he around, you know? Yeah. And that's a frustrating feeling. That's, that's where the trail cameras serve their purpose in my mind. Yeah. Once I know he's there, yeah. I don't need to know exactly <clears throat> where he is every day. Yep. You're in the game yeah. at that point. I, I think yeah, I just need to know that I'm hunting the part of the farm where there's a buck that I would like to shoot that yeah. lives. That's enough. Yeah. You know, then I'll hunt him. Yeah. I think for us, this is tied to my comment earlier about, um, living the place that you hunt versus almost uh all of the places that jeremy and i hunt are like out of state and Mm -hmm. and we make it maybe twice a year if we're like maybe three times maybe we get to go shed hunt so we recently made it out to kansas where we you know really enjoy to hunt we shed hunted that we hopefully will make it back in like september to hang stands Mm -hmm. reposition Um, and then and then we're hunting and, yep. and November and it's game day. It's the, there's not a lot of room for error there. You've got five or six days to make it happen. Mm-hmm. And so we really find, um, a lot of utility for the cell cameras, especially. So we run, uh, stealth cams with solar panels on them. So there's, mm-hmm. there is no maintenance. We don't have to go change batteries anymore. In fact, this is the first year that while we were out there like two weeks ago, shed in fact, we found some of these sheds here on the table while we were walking, we got out these, uh, cell cameras for the first time ever, we're going to have like summer information. with solar panels. Yep. So we don't have to touch. I mean, normally you put a camera out even with lithiums and, and you know, uh, I don't know, two months and it's dead. And it's for the same reason. It's not like, you know, I'm trying to pattern a deer throughout the summer. Cause obviously that's useless for a late November yeah. rut hunt. We just want to know what buck is in the area. Is he using it more, you know, mm-hmm. than just the time that Should we're we there spend our and, time there? Yeah. And every once in a while yeah. we get lucky with like, maybe we'll kill a deer. That's like, we hadn't had a picture of that deer since, uh, you know, June. It's like, there he was, you know, and yeah. And and that's the, that's the thing about the net that you're putting out has big holes in it. And Mm -hmm. the nets that I was putting out had little bitty holes. So I was catching all the fish right? because I was using bait in front of the camera. Yep. So I would do it for a very limited amount of time and then then get completely away from it. You Mm -hmm. can put bait in front of cameras in Iowa. You just can't hunt over it. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, so, you know, you have to be really, really careful and you got to talk to the local game board and find out really how does he interpret this. But I wanted the, the, you know, the openings in my net to be really small. I wanted to know every single deer on the property as quickly as I could and then get completely out of there with the cameras and the bait. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause the way you guys are doing it, there's a lot of fish that can slip through that net. Oh, a ton. Um, I mean, we'll see, yeah. we'll see bucks. Well, even uh, grab that. Grab spider, man. Well, so Bill, in, in Kansas, you can hunt over bait. And so we've got several of our cameras over trophy rocks, you know, just because right. I've, I've had a lot of success. In Ohio, you can do the same thing. So I run those over yep. trophy rocks, and we've done this in Kansas. And So this was one of those bucks, Bill, that we – this is actually a public land Kansas buck, um, probably a four-year-old. And we didn't have him on camera until December. 
Uh, so we we had <coughs> placed cameras there early. We had hunted in November, a different buck, and then on this camera in December, this deer shows up, and I watched him in December, January, into February, and then a couple weeks ago, you know, we walk in and, and find one of his sheds, and, and this deer probably is going to be low 180s come next year. Um, and, and it's kind of an interesting thing from us because – you know, now we're like, okay, we know where this deer is, but the only data we have on them is December and on. So is it even going to be relevant when we go out and hunt in November? I hope so. Cause he's going to be a giant, but who knows, right? There's, there's not enough there tangible to say yes or no. You don't know until September 15th, exactly. basically, or, or thereabouts, you know, yep. from then on for the next few weeks. Yeah. Well, and this deer didn't actually show up until like December 1st. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sure knowledge. he was in the area. Yeah. It's just, Again, and that's the one thing that I think everybody, and I'm guilty for it, right? I depend on my cameras too much. It's like, listen, that camera still only captures so much, especially if you're not using corn or bait or anything in front of it. You know, the odds of that deer passing through that detection range is still very limited, right? You know, walks right yeah. behind it, walks around it, whatever. So like, you know, people will be like, well, you know, I'm just not having anything on camera, so I'm not going to hunt. And it's like, I, and I've fallen into that trap and then I, I miss an opportunity. You know, I can't kill them well, if you're not there. Obviously, there's a lot of reasons, you know, why that doesn't work, you know, the worrying too much about your camera um, photos. But, mm -hmm. you, you know, a lot of people are hunting the fringes of some other bucks range. Mm -hmm. They don't know it. Yep. Right. Because they don't own enough land. Exactly. Or control enough land. Who knows what's happening a half a mile away, two properties over on a piece of land that the guy never even tells you he's got trail cameras out or maybe he doesn't even have cameras out. You know, right. So there's you might be on the fringe of a range that you don't even know you're on the fringe of. Yeah, you or know, he's, the, or he's the feeding tongs. heavy, and yeah, he's just literally at somebody else's feeder, but spending time. And well, in a place like mm -hmm. Kansas, and I know even <clears throat> in, in Iowa, in these fragmented landscapes, you know, we've got some of these bucks on the same, you know, two cameras that are literally, as a crow flies, three miles apart. Yeah. You know, they're just, it's a hop, skip, and a jump over a mile, you know, flat cattle pasture, you know, and they, yeah. they do it every day. Well, the, in that kind of country, they, their ranges are much bigger too, especially the linear type areas, like where you've got creeks yep. or rivers that they follow. Yep. Um, they might have a range that's four miles long. Yeah. You easy. know, whereas in easy. Iowa, you know, I might get bucks that are the same age that might be living on 30 or 40 acres. Yeah. So what is that, what is that country is. like where you're at or where you killed this buck this fall? I guess kind of walk us through it. Is <laughs> it, is it like your old property, timber ridges and stuff or? Very similar to that, except the, the topography is about multiplied by three. Really? So it's the, they call it the driftless area, which oh, is yeah, no, very it's much. the bluff country. Yeah, it's the bluff country of the Mississippi River. And if you follow that, I mean, the Wisconsin's got the same thing, really yep. vertical ground. You know, uh, south, south eastern Minnesota is very similar, very yep. vertical bluff country. Yeah. Uh, a lot of limestone, cold water springs, trout streams. That's what I say. You catch trout in the driftless area. D do you think yeah, there's anything to that, Bill? Have you heard guys talking about big bucks being found in limestone country? Mm, we we killed some freakishly big deer in southern Iowa where there was no limestone. Yeah, no, nowhere close. <laughs> I was just wondering because Weston said something about that last week, and I was like, I've never heard. Oh, of yeah, that I mean, it, it all comes back to the the fertility of the soil, right? Yeah. If you start to look at that fertility map and and how that all overlays, people will say, well, yeah, look at where the alfalfa is. Well, that's because that's where the best soil is too. Mm -hmm. Like it, right? It, you know, that's the root of of everything. And so when you look at that, you're you're really close to the Mississippi River. Like you you've got whether it's farmland or not, you got high quality soils in those areas. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and it was, you know, that is good. The, the ground is good. Um, but the, the thing that makes it unique, I think, and, and why I love it is the beauty of it. You yeah, know, it's it's big, you know, big hills, beautiful. You, you, know, you can get back into some places where there's, you know, hardly any uh, noises that you hear, you know, we're just you yeah, get that's away. That's awesome. Yeah. And uh, I think that's what I like about and, and, and love about that area. And I, and I grew up there too, you know, I'm, I'm going home. You know, everybody yeah. likes to make that trip home, you know, so to speak. Um, You're like, hey, so uh, does this pass good. from 30 years ago still qualify for me to hunt your property? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still good, right? We're still good. It would if the same guy still owned it. Probably. I I love that rem uh, the beauty aspect of it too, Bill, and just really the remoteness is yeah. like something that I long for that we get out of Kansas. Yeah, this spot that we found this shed and where I do most of my hunting out there is, uh, it's actually it's public land, but it's it's a it's a far back corner of public land that's bordered by private on one side and a refuge on the other. And the mm -hmm. only way to access it without barging through the entire piece of, you know, huntable ground is uh, on the river. So we actually, the first time I found this spot, we found a, a guy with a kayak in town, just through a buddy. 
uh, it had some holes in it. So we used some you, flex seal. You sat a little bit low to the water we line. We used some flex seal. I had like a lone wolf on the back. I had my bow on the front and I, you know, I weigh 200 pounds yeah. and I kayaked down this forever. Jeremy dropped me off and <laughs> I got all the way back into this deep corner. Mm -hmm. Um, and I missed, well, I skipped one off the shoulder blades of a, a big, but would have been my biggest buck for sure. The second day I was in there at one o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and it's just, it's remote oh, there. Yeah. You can't hear anything. There is nobody there. There's like coyotes running everywhere. And for somebody who's, you know, we're Pennsylvania guys here and I hunt Ohio, but it's like, man, it's not uncommon to see another guy walk into their stand or you hear the Amish buggy, you know, clopping down the road, but in Kansas and I, There's I nothing. assume other parts of the Midwest, it's just remote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, I think the more I hunt, the, the you, you're not hunting as much to kill the trophies as you are for the experience and the memories, yeah. you know, and, and so the, where you hunt and how you hunt becomes just as important as what you're hunting, what you're trying to kill. Um, and, you know, I don't want to hunt places where there's nothing, you know, sure. because that's no good either, but you know, I would give up trophy quality in exchange for a really high quality experience. Yeah. And I think that's where, that's what Jared and I really liked about North Dakota was, you know, we didn't necessarily think we were going to go out and kill you know, 180 inch mule deer, though that they, they definitely exist. Mm -hmm. uh, the exciting part about it was that we were on public ground, never been on it, do it yourself. And we just had to make it work. Well, yeah. That's a great example. Well, granted it was our first mule deer hunt. So maybe there was some novelty to that, but, um, we got Nick sent someone else, oh. but, um, yeah, it was just, it was just the experience when we didn't kill that big a box. I mean, you killed probably a two-year-old buck. I killed probably a three-year-old buck and yeah. like not a crazy trophy by any means. But as I said, that's the most fun that I had. Oh, it was all crazy. Of last year. I shot my buck. It was full velvet and had a little drop time, which I'd looked at Jared and I was like, it's velvet has a drop time. I'm going to kill it's this just deer. the experience, right? man. The fact that we drove <laughs> like 25 hours straight, like almost back underneath me, yeah. the way that this ledge was cut. <laughs> You know, Bill, he's looking back at me because we're following each other around <laughs> through these bluffs and he like looks back at me and he's like, he's like, there's one right here. I was like, I was like, okay. And we weren't filming. I was just following him. Yeah. You know? And he's, I was like, how big? He's like, 140, 140. <laughs> and I was like, oh, see, yeah, sounds cool. That's a cool opportunity. I think I kind of <laughs> talked you into it. I couldn't see the deer. Well, when he, uh, first of all, I've never killed a velvet buck f before. So that was my main driver, yeah. you know, to have an opportunity to spot and stock, kill a velvet muley on public land. And then like he turns his head and I see this like two and a half inch drop tine on the one side. I'm like, yeah, he's dead. That's doing, <laughs> that's, that's doing it for me. So, but yeah, I think it is. So I guess with, with this property, obviously you've got a lot of ties to it. What, what kind of deer did you see when you started running cameras? I was surprised, um, the number of middle-aged quality bucks, nothing tremendous. I mean, I killed the biggest one that lived there, at least the biggest one that I had on the trail camera. Um, but there were probably 20 of them that were three, you know, age three and plus mm -hmm. on the 500 acres. And that's a lot. Um, yeah. So, you know, I do think that the area gets a fair amount of pressure. So I don't know that, you know, there's probably a lot of threes and fours that get killed every year. So I don't know that you're going to say, okay, next year I'm going to come back. There's going to be 24 plus, you know, age bucks. I don't, I don't think, I don't think it really runs like that. I think that you're just going to see a lot of three-year-old bucks every year in that area is what I think. And the, you know, the odd four plus, um, so that's kind of what I saw, which it was well. fun. You know I mean? It's not the same as when you own the land and you feel like a personal attachment to every little piece of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're still hunting on somebody else's farm, which is different, but you know, it's, it's, it's hunting and it was pretty, you know, a beautiful, beautiful area. Um, uh, the hunt itself was a lot of fun. The deer was the deer I killed was a really nice deer. I mean, like I said, he was the biggest one there that I, that I knew of, but, uh, you know, it's not the same overall experience as when you're hunting property that you own. Sure. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Do you, do you want to try to fix that real quick? Maybe Bill, you're sounding kind of monotony to me. Maybe just try to adjust your phone real quick. It might just be your microphone. How about that? Check. It sounds the same. Hmm. It was weird how it just changed like that. Can you hear it? Maybe. Um, so when, so you knew that buck was in there, obviously that's the big, that's the deer I assume you were targeting. Yeah. And so what, when, when was that, uh, did you hunt him multiple times before you killed him? Well, and, and you know, again, um, you know, my, my reasons and, and my motivation for hunting and even my priorities have changed now because I'm not worried about 
daily content and having a story to tell. So I was more concerned about killing the deer too soon or killing a deer too soon, you know, because I didn't prepare, you know, with the move and with you know, the, the focus on being around family. I didn't, I didn't have outside tags. I didn't have tags for other states. Mm-hmm. I don't own land, so I don't have a landowner tag, you know, like I used to have, you know, where I could fall back on that if I killed early. Yep. So I, I spent more time just kind of running cameras, bumming around, waiting. And then I started hunting on the 25th of October. And uh, I killed him on the 29th. It was like, that's not what I wanted to do. You know, I mean, I'm not saying I didn't want to shoot this deer. <laughs> I, would, I wanted to shoot him the 29th of November. You right. Know? <laughs> right. You know, but, but you know, you can't click a gift horse in the mouth. And there he was, you know, 10 yards away. I'm not certainly not going to pass him up. But yep. that was the fear was that, you know, I might get lucky and kill too soon. And there yeah. was a couple others there that I would have shot as well. He wasn't the only deer that I would have shot. He yeah. was just the one that I would have liked the most to shoot. Yeah. Um, I think so that... anyway, the so I was done the 29th of October. So I had the whole month of November. Mm. Didn't have any plans. You know, and I didn't want to go someplace else, you know, when my stated goal was to spend time around mom and dad. Right. So I spent the month of November uh, walking public land, you know, just scouting. Um, you know, I didn't hunt anymore. But I covered tons and tons of ground just because I love that country. You know, yeah. I love just being out in it. Um, so that was fun, you know, and, and just got to know the locals a little bit, you know, did a little bit of work in the, the fields, you know, with, with some of those guys that, you know, that, that I knew in the area, you know, running chisel plow or whatever, you know. So I did I did things that, you know, that I more wanted to do, yep. you know, let's say, rather than felt like I needed to do, where, you know, if I would have had a TV show or a, or a online show to produce there's no way i'd have been running a chisel plow. you would have been pressured into figuring out somewhere to hunt in november that's right and yeah. i'm not saying i don't love hunting i do love hunting i miss being in a tree in november but it was kind of nice and refreshing to take that whole month and just walk around and just you know, do other stuff um it is funny about that you it's, know it's like, a good feeling well dude when i killed this fuzzy wuzzy buck you can't see it from here but but i killed a, a big velvet buck in my family farm in ohio the second day of the season which never ever happens right. for me. And I just remember I was like, I don't need to do anything. I was like, I'm just going to wait until what? And November was kind of the, or I'm sorry, uh, Kansas was the next. Yeah. And in, in November. Trip. Mm-hmm. I think that's kind of, we're trying to achieve the same thing, but you know, just make more opportunities for if we are successful, it's like, okay. Uh, you know, we don't need to be stressed out trying to do all of them at once, but if one of them comes through, let's have some other opportunities for us to try something. Well, we know there's only so much time, right? And and we do, Jared and I, we've, we've leased in, well, more ground in Ohio. I've got a place in Kentucky. We have land in Indiana, Illinois, and Kansas. So we have a ton of opportunities and there's no way like in the perfect scenario, it's like, oh yeah, we're just hunt for a living. That's not what we do. We have a full-time job. We've got yeah. families, we've got things to do, but for us, it's more of opportunities, you know, because if I don't see anything in Kentucky, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hunt it. Maybe the kids hunt it with me, but like, I'm not going to personally hunt it. I'll just be like, well, I'll take this one weekend and head out to Illinois and, and hunt this mature buck that I'm wanting. And sit back and watch in the meantime. That's kind of the beauty of what we found with the cell cameras is like, we don't, we don't have to be there. That's what I'm saying is I think we're almost trying to achieve the same thing. It's like, we want to have some history with these deer. That's why we go try to find their sheds. Mm -hmm. We want to know just relatively that they're in the area or they've been there for a period of time. So if the event you know, happens that we get to actually go out and hunt them. It's like, man, even though we don't live here, this is a deer we've got history with. And it's, mm-hmm. it's just more satisfying, I think. Yeah. And it, I think for me, it's, it's, I never lost the love of hunting, but I want to get back to the, the pure love of hunting and not the business of hunting. Yeah. Um, and, and if I don't have to do it for a living, uh, I'm not, not necessarily going to, you know, like I haven't monetized anything that I'm doing now. I mean, right. it, it's, you know, I, I spend probably four or five, six hours a day creating content right now that nobody's paying me a penny for. You know, I try to interact and answer everybody's questions as best I can. I don't know if I'll ever monetize what I do content-wise in the future. Um, well, I mean, you kind of said but, you kind of said openly, um, like I know you're, you're kind of in the midst of posting this run of bucks that you've killed, right, on social media and mm-hmm. stuff. And you basically came out and said it. It was like, I just need to get in the hang of posting so this is how I'm going to like force myself to do it, right? Because it is work, it is time, it is commitment, it is consistency that has to happen. Yeah, and I think my my purpose now, I just have to figure out whether I really need to do this to make money or not. You know, I mean, I've got some other ideas. I might do some kind of a virtual consulting business, you know, like land consulting. Mm-hmm. Um, 
that that I would charge money for, but I'm not sure I want to monetize my content. Right. Um, you know, that way, if I feel like telling somebody that he's wrong <laughs> and, and I can alienate half of my audience, I don't care. Yeah, too bad. You know, because if he's wrong, he's wrong. I don't need to, you know, kiss his butt, you know, just because I, I can't alienate half of my audience, right? Right. You know, so you kind of get the idea. It's, it's, it'd be nice to be, to be able to say exactly what needs to be said rather than what makes the sponsors comfortable yeah um so are you filming there's certain, you know what i mean there's there's some brutally untrue and stupid things that get posted on some of the social media oh, yeah. that needs to be addressed yeah 100 oh, yeah. i mean it, yeah. and it's 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 always existed and i get it. it again it's business and i hate saying that because it's it's one of those things that i'm super sensitive of if like, like i live in the hunting industry you know it's where i make money for my family and for other families but i also like this is my true passion you know like, the it, hardest it is what one I love you know the do. hardest one for me to hear jeremy is uh two-year-olds getting called old bruisers and you know real over mature bucks i'm like there's nothing wrong with shooting a two-year-old if you want to shoot that, but yeah. call it what it is. Yeah. Say what it is. Yeah, a hundred percent. But but the but the worst though is the people who criticize um, when you make a mistake and they don't understand the situation involved. They just want to have a way to tear you up. Oh, and yeah. it's it's yeah. I've I've just shrugged for way too long. Well, I mean, um, Jared and I, Jared and I just got so these sheds we posted from Kansas on public land, right? And we just posted to social media. Guy comes after me, basically saying, "This is why all of us Kansas residents, you know, hate you guys doing this stuff." And I'm like, "I found sheds on public land, man." I was like, "What do you mean you're losing your hunting spots over that? Like these were sitting on public land, Army Corps of Engineer land in Kansas." But what are you talking about? You know, and it's just yeah. that's just how people are right now. They literally feel like us posting that by finding it on public land is ruining their hunting. Well, as see, a resident. and I would never even know the difference. I don't read comments. Like I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not on this podcast. I'm not, you know, filming our hunts and stuff for, to get somebody's reaction and whether they like it, they like it. Great. If they don't, I'm not going to have read to comment anyway. So let's yeah. just keep doing what we think is fun and what we enjoy doing and it will be what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's okay, but then you don't really serve the greater good of the, of the industry by not, addressing the comments because i'd say 50 percent of the comments that i get are questions sure you know like and i can help those half of my of my audience sure. i can help them mm -hmm. you know so maybe i can't answer their question in, in a way that, that, that you know because i don't know the answer mm -hmm. but if i know the answer you know i need to tell him you know because then he's a better deer hunter so if i didn't care i'm not calling the out jared but that's where a lot of these people are reaching out uh they want to know what you know <clears throat> and if you don't address the comments, then you leave that that question hanging. Um, I remember, <clears throat> excuse me, I remember before I was in the industry, I sent a letter to somebody who was an industry celebrity, and I was really, really curious about something like super, like I want to know what this guy knows about this. You know, I spent the time as a young man to write this letter, you know, and sent it to him, and I didn't never got a reply. And to this day, I'm still bitter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so care, care to care to drop a name? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah it, no, it makes no. it makes no. sense though, right? I mean, because it, again, if if you have the if you're blessed enough to be acknowledged as an important person in this segment, and somebody asks you a question, listen, I'll be the first to say we get asked a lot, especially my background being a wildlife biologist. Like, I'll give you some factual stuff, but most of the stuff I tell you is just my opinion or, or based on experience. Like, I'm, I have no problem saying, yeah, like, I'm okay. Like, I'm wrong on that. It's not I, a, I think, I think the struggle is like identifying the, you know, the, the good stuff. Like, cause I completely agree yeah. with you, but there's so much bad stuff or irrelevant stuff. It's like, man, how do you even find the stuff that warrants a response or that we should? Well, you, you know. Unfortunately, you try to respond to all of them, you know, yeah. and, and that's the hard part. Like, you know, like I said, I might spend five or six hours a day on this stuff. I might spend an hour and a half or two hours a day interacting. And yeah. that was where I got burned out a little bit at Midwest Whitetail too, is because, you know, I was, I was doing the Ask Linky platform and I had a bunch of other you know places and every single platform had that interaction aspect to it. Mm -hmm. um, I could spend three hours every single day, even during the hunting season, just interacting. Um, but yeah. now you know, I don't have a whole lot else that I have to do, you know, so I can spend that time feeling like, well, like it's a gift you know, yeah. to these people that are interested. You know, if somebody has if somebody to take the time to ask me a question, I feel like it's, it's rude on my part, not to somehow 
address that. And, and maybe you just click the like button on all the comments. Yeah. Maybe you don't say, hey, thanks, buddy. You know, have a great day. Maybe you don't go to the trouble to actually reply to every comment that isn't a question. But I feel like when somebody asks a question, you know, as industry, you know, whatever you want to call it, representatives, it's our responsibility to to try to help them. I, um, I would how, how, how are they getting there? Yeah. How are they getting from point A to point B without that? Yeah, I you would agree. I mean? I, and I, I think, you know, and Bill, you probably have more experience with this recently. Like, you know, and I've seen some of the comments just following around with your new pages and stuff. But, you know, people have definitely, I won't say they called you out, but but have questioned the, you know, why leave Midwest Whitetail now, right? Because, mm -hmm. it, you know, transparent. And Jared and, and Mike and those guys are, are great, right? And they've been such a big piece of the story. But, yep. you know, it, Bill Winky was the, the, the figurehead, right? I mean, that's what people related to. And so I think for a lot of these guys, and they don't understand, again, how we started this podcast with all the background and the work and the economics of it and stuff. But I mean, they've, they've kind of looked at you as like, Bill, like, why'd you just leave us? You know? And it, it's a weird, I think you've done a good job answering a lot of those questions, but that's, that's a tough thing because you are still connected to it, you know? Right. And I think that that's where the new voice comes in. Yep. You know, the new Bill Winky brands or Bill Winky platforms I'm trying to create is not necessarily, like I said, for me to make any money on it. You know, we'll see maybe if I have to, at some point, I'll figure out how to monetize it. But right now I don't have any sponsors, haven't had any conversations with anybody, mm -hmm. you know, about paying me for, to be a part of my brand. I'm doing it more as a place for the, the people who were following me before that wanted help yeah. can find me. Um, well, we and, appreciate and, it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. And, and, and hopefully, you know, it becomes more than that. Hopefully I can, you know, put it this way. I mean, I've gotten to the point now where I don't have to make money doing this, Sure. you know, and, and especially if I don't buy any more land, you know, oh, and right. I sold a thousand acres of land. I know? mean, is that an option yeah, in the future? You can't, you can't tell me that's you're it. not still on the radar for land at some point here, right? Yeah, I am. So <laughs> that's it. You know, so yeah. if, if I don't, if I don't ever buy any more land, I don't have to really you're good. worry about making more money because, right. you know, you can put the numbers together and you can figure out, you know, what I got for the piece that I sold, right? Yeah. The, the point was though, not to, to cash out. The point was to try to replace it. Well, if I don't replace it, you know, it's just a re hard reality of it. I don't really probably have to create a bunch more income, but so let's say somebody comes along and says, Bill, I got a thousand acres up here in Northeast Iowa that we want to sell you. I'm like, Oh crap. You know, now yeah. <laughs> I, better, I better come up with some money. Got to figure you know, out so how to do it. <laughs> well, and you're not an idle hands guy. I mean, you, you talk yeah. about it from the football coaching and the track and field side and stuff like, and even now, like you're not, nobody's paying you, but you're spending X amount of time a day creating content because you, you need something to do. Yeah. And, and plus, I feel a responsibility now to the people who have gotten me to, you know, where I got. Yeah. You know, I mean, there was a lot of people that followed Midwest Whitetail that were interested in what I had to say about things. And and I want those people to transition over, obviously, to Jared and Mike and, and sure. Josh and Drake. And, and I want those guys to step up to that role. And they, and they are. Yep. But there are still a certain percentage of people who want to know, you know, hey, Bill, what do you think about this? And um, so now I still have a place where I have a voice. You know, and, and we'll see what that turns into. I don't have. I assume that's just his internet. Signal. Yeah. I find this farm and now, you know, I can't just coast along. You know, I've got to start generating some serious income again. So then I might have to ramp up. Mm -hmm. um so, so if that happens then you'll probably see all of a sudden bill winky's brought to you by <laughs> XYZ. Yeah, right, back to that <laughs> well so, what yeah. does that look like for you right now bill like you say you're creating content right now are you filming all your hunts from this past year or what does that look like no, for you no right now it's it's mostly uh written content and, and interaction you know like yep. ask, answering people's questions you know yep. on the social media platforms and you know i'm posting stuff on the billwinky.com website and i'm going to do more of that um but I'm just trying to have more, just try to get back out there a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, not just disappear. Um, well, I mean, that was, I've, I've a, that was one of the attractions ahead. here, Bill, for, for me at least. I mean, cause you know, you and I've kept in touch over the years and, and, um, but I always was able to keep in touch with you beyond just talking via content. Right. And then, mm -hmm. you know, after the kind of, I sold the farm episode, then it's like, you know, what's Bill doing? You know, and then that was kind of my, like, what is Bill's life after Midwest Whitetail, right? And and I think a lot of us, you know, 
you have you owe us nothing, right? The the wealth that you've given us over the last decade plus has been just unbelievable. And it probably made who knows how many deer hunters better for watching what you've done. And so you don't owe us anything, but it's kind of like, where's the saga go? Like you can't, right. you, you ride off into the sunset and we're all <laughs> left hanging. Like, uh, like an anarchy. You can't do this to us. Yeah. Bill. Like, <laughs> what do you mean? You're going to ride off in the sunset. I need you come back to us. But, but, but so I, mean, I think through what it, you're doing, that that's a big kind of piece of the, the puzzle that we were, we were all wondering. Yeah. And for the people that feel that way, they can catch me, you know, on the billwinky.com website and I'll continue to do a better job there of, of making that relevant and, and educational. But uh, let me throw out an idea and see what you guys think of this. I mean, the whole world can listen now because you got how many millions of, of listeners? Uh, like a lot. 50? Yeah, we're, oh, yeah. We're, pretty <laughs> we're pretty up there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm messing with you. So my thought is to do, rather than to do daily video blogs, uh-huh. you know, where I got to have a guy in the tree with me. Yep. What if I do like daily audio blogs, Ooh. you know, like, uh, you know, where now I can film a little bit in the tree with my, you know, my cell phone, you yep. know, I can pan and show them where I'm at and yep. maybe even like little snips when I'm walking up to the tree, you know, and just talk about the strategy. And then at the end of the hunt, you know, just do a little wrap up, you know, right before I climb down and say, you know, guys, this wasn't, you know, it wasn't awesome, but you know, I did see these two little, you know, whatever, you know, year and a half old bucks yep. tomorrow, I'm going to do this. And, and I don't have a guy in the tree and I don't have hardly anything invested in that, you know, from the standpoint of, of removing me from the, the passion of just going hunting, mm-hmm. but I could post something like that if, if I can get the technology right at the end of every day. And, yeah, yeah. you know, you throw a little voice recognition software in there, you know, now I've got a, a, you got a mixed blog. media post. Yeah. 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 So I feel like that might be my future where I don't have a guy in the tree with me. I don't have a bunch of expensive camera gear that I'm lugging around with me. I'm just going hunting and I've got this little cell phone that produces, you know, reasonably good quality stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to post off that every day and just see where it leads. Um, I think it's perfect. That's my. The audio side has been a a huge growth opportunity, right? I mean, thus us sitting here doing the podcast. And obviously we have a visual aspect to this. But, you know, when you get into that, I always think back to the, um, you know, if you ever fish like saltwater and even some freshwater places, you hear like the fishing report thing, right? It was always audio type of thing. Like, here's the latest fishing report, blah, 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 blah. You know, and it's real-time information, it's valuable information, and it's relevant information. And I think that more and more people are are apt to listening to that, whether they're driving to work, they're they're exercising, they're at the office. Um, you know, it, it is the next big form of of media that has has really swallowed up a lot of stuff and is outrunning and outpacing TV for sure. And I think making it you know multi level where the same piece of content could be posted on YouTube because there would be the video element of it. Correct. It would be posted on an audio only platform because Mm -hmm. you you do it in such a way that you don't have to see stuff. Right. And then at the same time, if you got the correct voice recognition Mm -hmm. system in place, it could be posted on my own website as a, as a blog with a couple of photos. Yep. Um, you know, and that's kind of the direction that I'm leaning. If I can figure out, like I said, the technology of how to do that as painlessly as possible, that's what you, that's where you'll see me, you know, big time in the future. And that's where that, the Bill Winky YouTube channel will evolve into. It's never going to be, uh, um, the same as what Midwest White Tail look like. I mean, I'm going to stop posting these, you know, traditional or not traditional, but throwback hunts, you know, at some point, you know, I've kind of freshened up that platform. Now I've got a few people coming to it. They know about it. There's a reason, you know, for them to care now, and mm-hmm. I'm going to bring out this, this other style of media, uh, at some point and just kind of see where that leads. I feel like that's as much as I'm willing to do, you know, yeah. as far as how, how much, um, invasion into the classic you know, hunting experience that I'm willing to tolerate. And, and, uh, you know, again, I just don't want to have the guy with me and not that I don't like the people, mm-hmm. but part okay. of the reason we bow on is because we want to be alone. I love it. I think there's a lot of value to <clears throat> just you doing it the way that you want to do it. And just even you saying that, you're like, man, I just don't want to have a cameraman with me or I don't want to lug and, and do all of this stuff. I mean, that's at least not that we're successful by any means, but that's why we enjoy doing the podcast this way is that there's no structure to it. We're not doing stuff we don't want to do. We're not talking about stuff we don't want to talk about. It's just, it's fun. It's Mm -hmm. enjoyable. And I think that, you know, you doing that paired with the fact that what you've always done, I think really, really well, better than probably anybody else is that 
um, it, it's almost like the hunter's journal aspect. I, th- I kind of, in my mind, have the vision of like the old time hunter who kept a note, like literally wrote down yeah. notes and he would talk about, well, today I saw this and I had this encounter with this buck that I think I've seen. And so I think to have an audio version of you doing that on a daily basis, which is unique to our industry is mm-hmm. really cool. Yeah. yeah. And I think keep it, keep it under 10 minutes, you know, and, and, you know, get right to the point, you know, don't do a bunch of, you know, just yakking for the sake of talking. I sure. think people would, would start following it. Yeah. Hopefully. I, I completely agree. I, I think that, Again, it's that that information. I mean, really, the storylines, the information. Yeah. I mean, that's what we're trying to grab onto. And 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 you can see that there are certain people that are doing it correctly. And that's why people follow Aaron and those guys on Hunting Public. Is that the, it's just constant, mm-hmm. frequent content that's coming out. You know, and and but then there's a ton of guys that are just they they're so regimental in this like framework of 22 minutes and you know beginning and middle. And it's just like nobody likes that anymore. I'm, I'm curious, Bill. Yeah, and I, I- so we'll see how it plays, but that you guys are, you know, and, and your your listeners are kind of early in the in the evolution of of the type of media that I believe I'm going to lean toward producing. So we'll, it'll be an experiment that we can all learn from, I guess, to see if it works. Uh, the trick is going to be figuring out how to make it convenient and how to push it. You know, so yep. I, I don't want it to be a pull only system. Um, but again, there's a lot of technology out there. There's got to be certain platforms that I can purchase, you know, where I'm a licensee of something where I can click here and it distributes my media to all the places it needs to go, you know, and, and it sends notifications to the people who want to be notified. Mm-hmm. I mean, I got to find that type of a, of a system. And that way, <clears throat> again, if it's a half an hour at the end of every evening, hey, it's all good. If it's yeah. three hours, not good. Yeah. You know, so... That's, that's where it's got to get to. Well, I know I speak for both Jeremy and I, you know, if there's ever any way we can help you with that, we certainly are happy to, you know, pay you back. And that's that, what that we way. do. Yeah. <laughs> we know how to do that. <laughs> it exists. We know Absolutely. how to do it. I, I am curious, yeah. I am curious, Bill, what, uh, approach you would take to that. And I look at kind of like a Midwest whitetail style voice. That's more, um, just, just raw or, you know, giving an update type of a style versus chasing November, which is obviously much more, you know, story driven and polished, almost polished. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it, I'll have to see, I mean, obviously I'm going to start out just <clears throat> real simple Yeah. and then see what it grows into because the, the, that's the beauty of digital is the audience always tells you what they want. They tell you what to do. All you mm-hmm. have to do is listen. That's why you got to read the comments, Jared. Mm-hmm. They'll tell you what to do next. <laughs> Come on, Jerry. Well, I, I hear I hear it. I don't know if I'm fully on board yet because I do want to do what people want to watch, but not as much as I want to do what I want to do. Well, I think I think really when it comes down to the comments, the hardest part is you got to have some tough skin at the end of the day because yes. you are so invested in it that when somebody says, hey, you suck, it's yeah. like, no, you yeah. suck. No, you <laughs> suck. <laughs> See, I couldn't, I couldn't say, no, you suck before. Well, you just said it now. So. Now I can't. Now I can say it. Oh man, that's I funny. can't wait. No, I'm just <laughs> no, it is the, the it, amount of that stuff. It's the right you move. Just I, I think for for people that have followed you in the journey, it's just something to to grab onto, you know. And and ultimately, I think for you finding kind of I don't want to say your peace, but but you really have found a groove for where you want to be and spending time with family and and experience that journey. It, frankly, that's kind of one of the reasons I love solo filming, even though it's tough. Like I'm still, yeah. it's just me there doing it. It's still me one on one with that buck, and I don't have to worry about no offense, Colton, but no, a cameraman moving or extra scent or or something like that. Yeah. Like if I screw up, it's my own fault. <laughs> just more pure, like Bill's talking yeah, about. Yeah, it's just that's part of both. Yeah, and there's and there's a lot of trees that you can't even hunt because you can't put two people in them. I uh, know. Bill, no. who was who was your best <laughs> cameraman? Ooh. What's that? I, I was just, and the reason I ask is because we've been watching a bunch of these throwback hunts that you've been posting. I can hear Greg behind you. I think in one, I could hear yeah. Zach behind you. <laughs> I'm curious if you had like a a cameraman that you were most in tune with or that it kind of worked out the best with. I thought they were all really good. I really did. You know, I felt like that's a bill. You know, Zach was the, <laughs> what's that? Okay, we'll talk, we'll talk after. That's a bill answer. They're all good. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I really did. I mean, yeah. I think Greg was the one that was most, let's say artistically driven. Yeah. I mean, for him, it wasn't just to capture the hunt. It was to capture it a certain way. Yeah. And then, you know, I think Aaron started evolving into that, you know, during the time he was there, 
I think Zach was a little bit more of let's just get this captured. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be artistic. We don't need all these little backlit cool shots of the leaves, you know, blowing in the wind and stuff like yeah. that. You know, creative camera angles, you know, maybe quite as many pans, you know, like moving camera shots. And mm-hmm. Greg was very much into the cinematic side of it. Um, so I felt like, I mean, I knew that those guys were, were too good to stay. You know, yeah. I really did. I mean, they were, they were too good at what they did to work for somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I was sad, of course, that they left, but they, I knew within a few years that, you know, I mean, and I could continue to pay them more, but I still knew at the end of the day that that's economics you know, as good on your as they end were, too. As good as they were, they shouldn't work for somebody else. Have um, you got, have you talked to those guys at all recently? I mean, a little bit here and there. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's they've got their own thing going. You know, and they're and busy. They're really busy, and they're you know, I, I won't say that that we're trying to figure out how to work together or anything like that. Maybe someday we will. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to tie in tight with anything. You know, yeah. I want to kind of do like we've what like we've talked. You know, where I get to set my own course. You know, if yeah. I have collaborations and partnerships and all these things, then there's all these expectations. You yeah. know, and and I don't want any expectations. I want to do it on my own terms and then see if it works. Um, because some, yeah, as you guys know, I mean, you do it on somebody else's terms most of the time. Yeah, um, it's pretty rare that you get to set your life up to do it on your terms. And 100%. now I have the the luxury of being able to do that, so I'm going to. Does some uh, part of you now kind of looking back and seeing like where those guys have gone, do you kind of look at it like the proud dad a little bit to see like what they've well, done? I, I think it was, it was, um, I wish they wouldn't have left because I, know. I, I was really staking the future of Midwest Whitetail on those guys, Yeah, you know, because, you know, everything I knew I poured into them yeah. and, and, you know, we didn't, it wasn't like a, a, an employer employee relationship. It was like, I was really trying to make those guys, you know, me, Mm -hmm. um, because what I wanted to do is ride off into the sunset and still own it and not worry about it and let those guys operate it. And, and, uh, you know, maybe I didn't communicate that message well enough, or maybe there was some other issues, you know, that came up along the way that we just never got past, but, you know, somewhere along the line, they, they decided that they wanted to do it their way, you know, and and they should, like I said, I mean, they had a brand that public land brand was strong. Yeah, it was really a strong brand, and and that started at Midwest Whitetail. But they did that; I didn't do that. Mm-hmm. You know, I encouraged them when when we started seeing the the growth of that. But ironically, and this is kind of funny, you know, some of our sponsors were like, uh, you know, Bill, we're not so sure about this public land stuff. You know, mm-hmm. they don't buy ground blinds. You know, they don't buy food plot seed. They right. don't buy. It's a different. You know, it's a different consumer. Yeah, that's right. So. It wasn't like our sponsors were really ate up with it. So what we were going to do was we were going to switch it over and we were going to have two different shows. We were going to have a public land show Mm -hmm. and Midwest Whitetail. And those guys were going to operate the public land show. And we kind of hit that point where there was going to diverge. We even had some brands and some logos we're working on. And I think that's where they got in their, in their minds. Like, why would we do this when we can just do it ourselves? Yeah. And they're right. You know, they they certainly could. And they did. I mean, obviously they did really, really well with it. Um, I wish that we, I wish that I would have stayed a part of it, but I don't blame them one bit, you mm-hmm. know, for, for doing what they did because, you know, look at, look, look, look what it turned into. Yeah. Um, well, and I think part of that too, uh, you know, and, and this is me obviously outside and, and like, I'm still really good friends with those guys still work with them on a lot of projects, you know, is, you know, in a kind of glass half full way, you know, it led you to finally saying, all right, here's my opportunity to kind of now do what Bill wants to do for himself. Yeah. So that was, that was the, that was the, beginning of the end yeah. um, for me at Midwest Whitetail, because that was my exit strategy, yeah. you know, was for those guys, those guys to, to step in. The right. So then, then I had to come up with a new one and, and the new exit strategy, of course, was for the 41 North guys, you know, Jared, Mike, Lee, Josh, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and uh, um, you know, that, that crew, um, you know, for them to carry the torch forward rather than mm-hmm. you know, for me to continue to keep this thing going. Cause it, you, know, you reach your physical limit on anything, you know, sure. and, and even your energy level, even your uh, passion for certain types of media, everything changed during that time, it became much more complicated. Yep. When Midwest White Bill started, it was a very, very simple model. Right. And as the years went by, all this social media and all these other things got twisted in there. And it's like, you know, I don't, I don't <laughs> really want to be like this social media guy, you know, I mean, so there's gotta be people who are better at that, you know, and, and so I'm holding this business back in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. you know, from the, the practical standpoint. So it made sense for me to have that 
you know, that, that exit strategy. So, you know, uh, everybody has to have something like that at some point, you know, you've got to be able to say, you know, I'm not going to run this thing until I'm 80. You mm-hmm. know, so how hard was that for you, Bill? I mean, not, not to like dig in deep personally, you know, and, and like, obviously this brand's fairly new for us, but my stone road brand is one that I've always like, I've had people approach me about acquisition and I'm just kind of like, yeah, you know, I like being my own boss. I like what we have going. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm 37, so I don't feel like I have to exit, but at some point everything's for sale. I mean, when it finally kind of hits you of like, all right, like I need to, I need to part with this, uh, or I'm going to part with this. I mean, uh, was it a comfort, a relief? Was it kind of a mix of both? Like what, how'd you feel? I think initially it was a comfort, um, because of the 80 hours a week yeah, that, know, that, that came with the turf. Um, mm-hmm. you know, but, but the, you know, there was also a part of me that said, you know, who am I now? I mean, what's my identity, you know, because part of your identity is what you do, you know, mm-hmm. for a living. And when that's gone, you have to kind of, you know, reevaluate. Sure you know, mm-hmm. wh- who you are and what you stand for. So mm-hmm. there was a little bit of a period of, of adjustment there too, to say, okay, now I'm no longer this mm-hmm. guy, you know, who am I? Yeah. Um, and I think the, you know, like professional athletes, I'm sure go through that. And I'm certainly no professional athlete, but I'm sure I put at least as much time into the year. Of, yeah. Of... We lost you. We, we lost just your audio. We can still see you. You check to see if it's muted on his end. So there, there you go. go. A lot of those guys, you know, their identity is wrapped up in in their sport that they're playing and their position yeah. within that sport. And then when that's gone, there's an emptiness that they have to find a, a you know a purpose. Um, yeah, that's so, a that's a good way to put it, though. I mean, and and I feel like that's probably where you're at now, talking about you know BillWinky.com and and the YouTube and is like you know how much do you want to do to have a purpose yet. At the right. same time, it's, you know, fairly, a, it's still a hobby. But it's, it's interesting to hear you say that now, Bill, because I think throughout the course of Midwest Whitetail, on a smaller scale, we heard you talk about that when you would kill a buck that you've been hunting for a few years. I know when you, you said that about the G4 buck and, and a few others that you invested a lot of time and it became kind of your life's mission to kill this deer. And when it finally happened, it's kind of bittersweet because it's like, now, now what do I do? <laughs> you know, is there, yeah. where do I go from here? Yeah. What's next? Yeah. yeah. So I think in, in, from a career standpoint, you know, like I said, it felt pretty good at first just to have that weight off. Mm-hmm. And then it was like, okay, well, what is it? You know, who am I now? Right. You know, so, and I don't know hundred percent, you know, where this all leads to, you know, I know I've got the ball rolling again. Let's just kind of see where it leads. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, God's always been pretty good about directing those paths and, and, you know, closing certain doors and opening others. And we'll just see what the next adventure is. Um, so it's not like a see you later guys. Hey, it's been fun. It's more like, you know, I'm shifting gears. Let's see what's next. Which That's I, exciting. I love that. I mean, yeah. and, and again, our millions of listeners for the Hunter podcast will uh, appreciate <laughs> that, but no, but seriously, I think it's one of those things that I was excited about because, you know, even with our personal contact over the last you know year or so, it's kind of like, you know, I don't really know what Bill's up to, you know, and I'm sure other people <laughs> are asking for that. And, and, you know, at the point where you're at, like you do whatever you want, but there is a hunger, I think, from the followers to say, you know, I even if it's a little bit, I just want to know kind of because when we saw like the picture of the buck you killed, it's like, what? Like, what do you mean? Like, where? When? Like, is it? Yeah. Is it filmed? Do we? Yeah. Is it working? I watch that. Does video? that air? <laughs> does that air this Monday or what? <laughs> yeah, that's can't a tough watch that one. <laughs> yeah, and, and and but then from my perspective, because I know you and I had many conversations where I knew you were trying to kind of pull yourself behind the camera more you know, especially in those latter years of Midwest Whitetail that I was like, when I was like, oh, Bill didn't film it. I'm like, good for him, you know, because I, yeah. I know what that f- probably felt like for you to kill a deer on your own terms with no film and just be like, yeah, I, I just hunted. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not trying to take myself too seriously to see where this all goes and, and you know, ride the ride the next wave, I guess, and, and see what that is. Um, so I'm I'm excited about that. I, I am. uh I'm going to run to the bathroom one more time if you guys don't mind. Yeah, man. Go for it. This coffee just runs right through me. Then I'll come back with kind of my final thought there. Okay. All right. right, Back. Cool. Welcome back. I usually drink about a half a gallon of coffee every morning. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds It's pretty weak coffee, so it's not a... It's not yeah. a ton of caffeine, but it's a lot of hot water. A lot of hydration. You, you, usually it's me, Bill, so I'm glad it's you this time. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I, can, I can tell when Jared's brimming over there. I'm like, you need a break? Yeah, I'm over here like. <laughs> yeah. 
We're going to have to start wearing catheters yep. on these things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Set it out for the long one. Um, no, Bill, I, I think that's good. I mean, uh, first of all, in Northeast Iowa, just so Jared and I have been putting in for Iowa uh, <laughs> preference points. We just left that one in there. <laughs> what, uh, we're, is, we're getting our, our third point Jeremy and I are working on this year. Yeah, and that's, year. that's because of me. I will come out and say, Jeremy, we got to hunt Iowa at some point. Let's start yes. putting in for tags. So we started doing that two years ago. Is it, is it more difficult to draw in that area than it is where, where you are in, in Albia in that south central part? I don't think so. Maybe it might be. You know, maybe it's four and a half years total, you know, Northeast and four yep. years average, you know, South Central. Yeah. It's not a big difference. It's not like years and years different. Mm-hmm. You know, I think four, if you have three points, you're going to draw South Central Iowa every year uh, or, or every time on number four, I believe. But mm-hmm. I don't know for sure if that's the case up in the Northeast part because it's a little bit higher demand because it's closer to Wisconsin. That's what I was going to say. You um, get a lot of that Wisconsin, Minnesota flowing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know the answer to that to be sure, but, um, you, you can draw somewhere on year four, uh, every time around. And, and if you're willing Wait, to help with a gun, you can draw almost every year on you know, year people four, draw almost every year. So three points plus then apply the fourth year. See, Cause I was always of the perception that it was for the good. I mean, for the good areas anyways, it's four, four points. And on the fifth year you'll draw, is that not right? No. I think it's three points and you draw on the fourth is what I think it is. I could be wrong. Well, I hope you're not um, wrong. Cause that means we'll be out there next year. Will we buy yeah, our point think, this year? Yeah. This will be our third point. We're getting in 2020. So it'd be 20 and 21. We will No, have, this is 21. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, 22. Yeah. We will have three plus points in our pocket plus a license and we'll be ready to go. Yeah. So the, that, that should be the okay. first chance for you guys, I would think. And, um, yeah. You can do your own research on that. I'm sure there's stats available. But I mean, if we don't draw, we just get another preference. Sometimes point. it's just like the trail camera thing. Sometimes we like a little surprise. It's like, <laughs> it could be four to six. It could be could be this year. Could be this year. <laughs> we'll be call. We'll be call. Hey, Bill, we need a spot. <laughs> yeah. um, so I guess, Bill, from from your perspective, and that's kind of cool. I mean, I, I like some of the surprise and the unknown of of where this goes. But at least with the BillWinky.com thing, like you've got now a place that people can kind of come and see what what you've got going on, and they've got content content to consume not only old stuff but new stuff that you're producing on a written basis daily yeah and, and i'm gonna i'm gonna lean toward that model that we talked about with the audio and the, the the multimedia on that um not sure exactly what that looks like yet but that's that's sort of my overall plan is just to you know see what that is mm-hmm. see if there's something there that's that's not too difficult and, and too consuming um to produce then I can have some fun with that. So, you know, this is all more of a, you know, a, 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 a progression. Yeah. So you know, I don't have the final answer and I don't, I don't think the world needs me. Um, but I think I still have a voice and I still have things I can do to help. And, and, uh, so I feel like, you know, I should be doing something. I shouldn't just be, you know, sitting here cause I don't want to retire, Yeah. you know? Um, and I am coaching track and I'm enjoying that. Um, but I don't want to just disappear and mow my lawn twice a week and be that guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Would you consider going back and doing any of that Western hunting or is that kind of behind? Yeah, you? no, no, for sure. That's the beauty of this too. Is you know, now, you know, now my time is my own, you know, I mean, I'll, you know, and I don't want to get so self-absorbed that I'm only focusing on what I want to do. Yeah. Happy but, wife, yeah, happy life, on. Bill. We've got room for <laughs> one more in North Dakota. That's for sure. <laughs> No, seriously, I could go on any hunt that I want to now. I don't have to worry about, you know, being home to produce a certain content for a certain day, you know, about some certain buck that I was hunting. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if I want to go fishing instead, you know, I'll go fly fishing rather than even going hunting. You know, I mean, there's nobody, I don't have to do it a certain way, which is kind of nice. And, and, you know, if nothing else, it's a little break, you hit the reset button and you're like, okay, got that out of my system. You know, let's focus back again. But, you know, you got to figure for 30 years. Um, I was working as hard as I could mm-hmm. every single day, you know, six plus days a week. Um, it just feels kind of nice to not have to have, mm-hmm. you know, my, my nose to the grindstone today. Yeah. No, I think that sense of, I think where you're at now is kind of like that sense of purpose that you're like, where's this going to drive me? Where, where do I feel that I'm achieving a sense of purpose, but not back to that, you know, weight on the shoulders that, that you'd been carrying for so long. Yeah. Yeah. Because it it does wear you down after a while. And, 
And you, you know, the relationships are what suffers. It's not, mm-hmm. you know, your work usually doesn't suffer. It's everything else. Yeah. You know, the, the relationships with the people that are around you, that's what suffers when you get burned out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's just kind of nice to be able to be fresh and, and have time for people, you know, rather than just look grumbling and looking at people going, Oh, you want my, you want, you know, some of my time too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, awesome. I can't even imagine guys like Michael Waddell, you know, and, and even the Lakoskis, yeah. you know, how well people don't respect that. They look at that and they think, Oh, if I was only those guys, what they don't realize is what they have to not endure, but what they have to work through yeah. because everybody wants a piece of them mm-hmm. and, and somehow they have to be, nice to everybody, yeah, you know, tough. through that whole process, you know, it's and without getting snappy and saying, man, I'm burnt out. I'm sorry, but I don't like you today. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, more of a, it's, it's harder than what people think. And I wasn't always the world's best at it. So I feel better now being able to <laughs> take a breath and say, well, I can, I can be nicer to everybody around me now. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it, it is. I mean, you know, when I think this year, you know, fortunate for guys like Michael and Lee and Tiffany, you know, I think that this year gave them a little bit of a breather because all those expos and all those appearances and everything canceled, you know, because of the right. co- COVID and that like, they probably got a self to put them back in, in check. But I know Michael, especially, you know, he spent more time with his family, he had it with his kids. He did more of that. You know, it will be a readjustment if trade shows and things like that pop back up here in 21 and, and so on and so forth. Like, that's a huge demand, that travel, that lifestyle on the road. And I think that's one where, you know, at least for you, it was so demanding. And, and I respect you because I've been in that position of, you know, when you did Midwest Whitetail and you had your office in your garage, like work was always there. You never yeah. could escape it. it. It was always within arm's reach, within sight. And and that's a tough lifestyle to have. Yeah. And, and you have to balance it. And, and it, you know, after a certain amount of time, you get tired of, of, of that. And, and again, I'm not complaining. It was an awesome, you know, an awesome run, but it's just the reset button. That's yep. it. You know, and everybody asks me, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And it's like, I'm hitting the reset button. That's it. There's no other agenda involved. I'm not mad at anybody. <laughs> You know, I'm not disappointed in, in any certain outcome of, of you know, what's happened. Mm-hmm. I'm just hitting reset. And I like it, man. That's a big yeah. refresh and, and, a, and a, new, a new look on so many things. And I think that's why people are going to be maybe I, I'm going to go out on a limb. Okay. Predict this is our most viewed podcast. Right. Uh, I think we owe Bill that much. <laughs> this we'll, make sure, we'll make this sure that it is. This will be our most viewed podcast, you better, right? You better promote it rather than just putting my name That's on right, it. That's right. We'll, 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 we'll make sure that we'll it is out there. But no, and, Put and some I mean, money behind it. Well, I mean, in per time, like, I mean, here we are, what, two hours into this thing. Like, we appreciate your time, Bill. Like, because, yeah. I mean, everybody's time's valuable. And and I was really excited about this. I told Jared, like, when, when you agreed to this, I'm like, man, like, Bill Winky, life after Midwest Whitetail. Like, what what is it? And, you know, people want to know. And and I'm sure that's weird from your perspective because like, it's just you, it's just you doing your thing and hitting the reset button. But for so many people, it is very intriguing to like, well, like, can he just stop? You know, can he just do <laughs> life? You know? And it's like, well, yeah, he can. Like that's, that's the beauty in this. And you know, that's, that's what people have to realize. Like you got into this, not because you're like, I'm going to make a business out of this. You got into it because you love it. You know, right. and, and, and that it led into this just crazy run of a business and Midwest Whitetail for how many years and what it turned out to be and what it still is, you know, is just, that was just the journey that, you know, kind of was left out there for you. Yeah. It was, it was more like riding the, the wave, you know, like I said earlier, you know, I'm just on a different wave. Maybe it's a pretty small wave, but mm-hmm. that's it. You just got to ride the wave of life. And, and, um, but anyway, the, even these two hours, you know, I couldn't have done this before. You know, I couldn't have spent these yeah, two hours no with you guys. Yeah. So again, the, the, the reset button does create a, a whole different, fresh, relaxed perspective on time. Um, I was always nervous about every minute. You know, like I can't be unproductive for one minute. You know, this would have driven me crazy just a few years ago. Yeah. You know, these two hours. Yeah. Now it's like, hey, maybe the guys want to talk for six. I got, I got track practice at four, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I mean, that was the thing. I mean, if you look back to what you're doing and I, I deal with it kind of on a daily basis and I've gotten better, honestly, with the pandemic, that's the bright side of it for me is, you know, they're not making any more time, right? You only got so much time in well, the day. You know what? And, we've and what are we've your been priorities? intentional about it too. I think yeah. between you and I, we've said like, man, we're freaking working too hard. Like 
even if things are going to suffer, like we need to take time to do this podcast is, is a mm-hmm. great, uh, it's a thing for us to sit down and not be working. We for, just decompress on it. That's why we just talk. Just we talk we have no agenda. And, like, I don't, I don't want to hear a lecture on, you know, food plots and timber stand improvement. I just want to talk. And even like, when it comes to the hunting season, Jeremy and I are really intentional about encouraging each other to say like, Hey, you know, I got your back on uh, this work thing. Like that you only have so many hunting seasons yeah, and it slips by so fast. Like take this time and, and make the most of it. You got to live. You, you, you've got to, and that whole make, you know, Hey, while the sun shines, that's good for a little while. Mm-hmm. But if the sun's shining all the time, you know, at a certain point, you're going to get pretty burned out making hay. So yeah. no matter how good things are going, you still have to take that time. Otherwise you end up like me, you know, where you're 30 years into it and you're like, wow, all I want to do is dig a hole someplace and crawl in there. Yeah. And that's what I know, you know, again, with this, I keep beating on the pandemic because we're kind of in it. But like, I remember it was sometime in October. I, I came, I left early. I don't, I was stressed out about something. Left early, went home, got the kids out, taught them how to shoot a crossbow and was like, hey guys, you guys are deer hunting this year. And they're like, yeah, this is awesome. I, and, and Emily, my wife was like, you know, what kind of make, and there's certain things in life, like, uh, you know, Bill, we didn't even touch on this, you know, uh, not necessarily it was on your property, but when I was with you guys, like I almost died. I, I rolled a tractor, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and it was literally, I spent ICU in Des Moines on my first father's day, um, yeah. with my, with my one-year-old son, you know, and it was one of those things that it was like, you know, I still get chills about it. Um, you know, Pam and Jordan saw me in the hospital, you know, the local hospital before they shipped me to Des Moines. You know, and and I felt okay, which was the weird thing about and I was young and I was in shape and I, you know, I felt okay, but I knew something was off. And I, and from the doctors, I also knew I had, you know, I'd lacerated my liver, I had internal bleeding, and that's why they had to get me to Des Moines so fast. And, you know, it, it, all at once, it kind of hits you where it's like, you know, I'd been traveling with Cabela. And that to me was my point. I loved what I did with Cabela's. I love being with you guys and spending time there. But it, it was at a point there where I was like, whoa, there's like, I need to slow down. Like there, there are different priorities in my life here that I, I, I don't want to say I neglected, but I took for granted. And so those kind of things happen in life. And, and, you know, I now look back on it and it's an experience that, you know, I don't wish on anybody, but it's a wake up call. Yeah. I just, I, I was like, wow, like I, you know, I need to do di- things differently in life. And that, I, yeah. you know, soon after, you know, Cabela's was a, not a thing for me and Stone Road was, and, you know, I've never looked back and I'm my own boss. And if I want to take off a day and take my kids fishing or go hunting or just go home, like, let's do it, you know? And yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's something that everybody has to work through on their own, I guess. Yeah. And I think that it's a, I think it's a natural thing, you know, at a certain age, you're full of the energy and you're full of the passion and the drive to make a name for yourself, to create something, which is good. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we need to be that person. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think if you're going to do that long term, you have to find some good balance to it, you know, and, and because otherwise it's a sprint and life isn't a sprint. You know, life is more like a marathon. So mm-hmm. if you treat life like a sprint, you're going to burn out a long time before you get to the end of those 26 miles. Mm-hmm. Um so that's a, that's a track and field analogy for you, Jeremy. You can probably oh, identify I, with that one. I do. And I, I mean, I still, even now I'm pacing myself, right? I'll go back into that track and field. <laughs> even though I'm pacing myself now, like there are days that I, and Jared knows it, you know, he's kind of my right hand here, you know, that I'm like, he knows I'm burnt out, you know? And, and it's just, there's only so much that one person can do, you know, and whether it's, I don't, I don't get frustrated as much. It does happen sometimes. It's just more of, I just get tired. You know, yeah. and, I, and I have to figure out if I don't have hunting or if I don't have fishing or, or things like that, I, I don't, you know, running for me is my outlet. Like I need those things to decompress because man, if you bottle that up, it is not healthy at all. I like to think, Bill, that's, that's the biggest contribution that I bring to Stone Road Media is I'm not necessarily the smartest person here or the best digital marketer, but I forced Jeremy to go out and live <laughs> life and take, and take breaks. Yeah. Um, you know, mainly so I could do it with him, but, yeah. uh, yeah, Jared yeah. has a sense of saying when he's with me, it doesn't count as days off. So yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I'm out with the boss. We're working. Yeah. But it's emotional it, is, support. It, right. it is super important. And, and I know, you know, just working with Bill side by side for, for several years, like that was one thing I thought I saw, not that you, you did it very well, but I saw how much you were doing, you know, and, and to your point, like every minute of the day that I was around you, like we needed to shoot this, film this, and then you were back in the office, whether it was on calls or writing articles or, you know, it, it was always something. And I mean, to your credit, 
that's why I think Midwest Whitetail got to where it is. Um, but I also know that that probably took a toll on you personally as well. Yeah. And I think everybody, there might be people out there with, with more capacity for that, but I do think that that's uh, a, a natural thing that, you know, we all have to watch, yeah. you know, because very few people can run as fast as they can for the whole marathon. Right. Yeah. So I just feel like, you know, maybe somewhere along the way, I needed one more person or something, you mm-hmm. know, somewhere, you know, might've been able to balance that better, but you know, it is what it is. And, and here we are. So I'm not going to yeah. worry about that. I mean, it forged the path. It, it got everybody to, to where it is and, and look at, look at the impact. I mean, that's one thing. And again, you know, it is, so I'm not patting you on the back, but again, look at the impact and, and even in today's standpoint, how many people Midwest Whitetail and, and you starting that touched and where all those people are right now. It, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, you know, me included, you know, I've, I've started at Cabela's and oh, now dude, here I am running a big part of the reason we're sitting here. Yeah. Big agent. Yeah. Jared literally is hired because he interacted with you. I was interacting with you and we got connected. Uh, it's, so, it's a weird so, thing. Th- thank you for that, Bill. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really? No, it's my pleasure. Yeah. 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 No, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And, and, uh, you know, I think the, just the way media changed. I think we were the push. Yeah. You know, the, there was, I remember early on, some of the TV people contacted me and said, you know, this, this is how it's going to be that, you, you know, you've changed this. And it would have been somebody else. There wasn't me. It's not like I was some genius. I just kind of tripped sideways into it and got open one door and closed Never another. Is. And there I stood. You know? <clears throat> yeah. So, but, but it was kind of fun to see that. Um, there's how, benefits how to being that, that leader of the pack, but there's also, there's a lot of people that then drafted in behind you and saved a lot of energy probably. Yeah. I think we showed people one way to do it. Yeah. Um, whether it was the best way or not, we certainly showed them one way to do it, mm-hmm. you know, to get away from the traditional media. And, um, and, and, and I think it enabled a lot of people to do really cool stuff because they weren't bridled by the platforms or by the companies they work for, whatever they had their own voice, you know, they could do it their way. Um, so I think that's pretty cool too, you know, just seeing the, the, the diversity of, of the type of media that's out there now. I mean, when we started Midwest White Tail, there was no hunting shows hardly at all on YouTube, right? Yeah. Maybe none. Yeah. Maybe none. Now there's however many, not, not that they wouldn't have, you know, occurred themselves. They would have, you know, somebody else would have stepped into that role because it was natural. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just kind of exciting to be on the front of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really was a lot of fun to see that whole thing change. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, it, it's crazy to look back and think about where it started and, and, you know, uh, transparently the landscape now is, is oversaturated, right? I mean, it, yeah. you know, everybody and their brothers got a show and it's digital and it's this and that, and, and there's some really good ones. And the unfortunate thing for some of those really good ones is they just don't have the connections or the business savvy to make it a business. Like it'll just so you be can, good. You can make a business around that yourself, uh, guys, if you want to, is by consolidating those shows and packaging it up into one package and then selling that package. Yep. You know, I thought about doing that myself and just saying, hey, I'll take the five or six best ones, you know, and, and, and form like a, a coalition, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And then I can sell those. You know, yeah. I can get the sponsors, you know, to go uh, across those platforms and these guys all get to make money. I make a little bit for being the, you know, the guy in the middle, but you know, it's like, what, one more thing. How many, how many hours a week is that going to be? You know, it's like, a lot. you know, somewhere you draw the line. Right. But yeah. that's, there is a business in that. Somebody could be that person that creates those coalitions. Well, that's, or that, you know, that's where the success I think comes from bill is, is at, at some point, whether it's this year or five years from now, consolidation will happen, right? You can't yeah. just continue to flail all these, uh, you know, arms and legs out there at some point consolidation happens and a pathway continues forward. Um, you know, it's just two ones we've talked about it and it's just like, I don't know, like, again, I, I don't, it's probably not me. I don't want to do it. <laughs> you know, I could yeah, do no, it. No. I can make that happen. But there's a business there. Yeah, there's there's a a business business. in that. And I love, I mean, anybody, I think that's the one thing the three of us all share is we have a hunger for entrepreneurship, right? And and that's where Mm -hmm. I say, you know, to you, like, I know you can't have idle hands because, you know, by heart, you are an entrepreneur, you are driven. And so something, whether it's just Bill Winky in an audio format on a daily basis that we all start tuning into, or it is something that Bill Winky's the kind of puppeteer behind, like, it's going to happen. 
right? And it's just when you want to do it. Let me give you one more. I mean, if you really want to get make a whole bunch of money uh, and 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 tie yourself to the to the grindstone, you know, one hundred percent, create this coalition and then create a marketplace behind the scenes where again everybody wants that direct sale how do you get that direct sale i mean we don't want amazon to be the only person that sells stuff right no. we want full margin sales let's say you pick one of your sponsors that you work with they make way more money when they sell it than when amazon sells it so how do you create a demand and a marketplace and and a, and a motivation because uh, mm-hmm. you know the, the stuff we did with cabela's really established in my mind 100 percent possibilities there yeah we on that turkey series, we drove tons of sales. They told me how much turkey stuff they sold yep. as a result of that. Paid for you a, and then multiple fold over top. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Way, way they, they made a ton of money on that little project with mm-hmm. us on that turkey series. So why not create this coalition of shows? And, and, you know, granted, I'm giving away somebody's master plan here. You know, this mm-hmm. I've tried this a couple of times and it's just a bigger thing than what I want to take on. Mm-hmm. But you could put a coalition together and then all of the action and, and effort within that coalition drives toward one marketplace. Mm-hmm. And then that spits out direct sales for the sponsors. So the sponsors have to pay quite a bit of money to be involved in your coalition because gosh, they're making a bunch. Yeah. You know, it has to be there has to be a way to keep Amazon from being the only retail point. Um, you know, if I was really smart, I would just go to Amazon and say, hey look, I can create this for you guys mm-hmm. and we can drive even more, you know, to you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you and know, they're but- not they're a volume and not a margin thing. Where Jared and I are in most of our manufacturers that we we represent, we are driving the e commerce from. It's funny right? to hear you say that, Bill, because like most of the time we spend not on the podcast is yeah, talking it's about driving that. E- <laughs> now, but that said, like yeah. you know, there's still the fear lingering is for most of our partners at least 60, if not 80% of the revenue is still big box, right? Yeah. And so you can only go so aggressive before it's like, mm-hmm. hey, I stepped on the toes of that guy and that's not gonna end well. And it's just like the transition you probably experienced firsthand with a digital web series versus you know traditional TV series. There's just a, a fear of the unknown of what that would look like or, or mm-hmm. how quickly to take that transition. Yeah, and there's always a solution to every problem. Um, so, I mean, maybe there's exclusive products, maybe there's different products, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? There's always a, a way yeah. around it. Um, you just have to create it. And, and it's anytime you give birth to something, you know, I'm sure women can attest to it. It's never a, a, an easy process. Giving birth is painful. Yeah. So every time you birth a new business idea and try to really ramp that up and make it happen, um, there's going to be a, a lot of pain. I mean, we and, did that with our business model. And, and again, a beat on the pandemic, but it was what gave us the ability to do it to where we flipped from basically standard retainer from stone road. And we still do some retainers or, or portion retainer to where we're actually making a commission on e-commerce sales for our manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And it takes the chains off of us as a company to be like, we could put as much effort and as much money into it. As long as they're seeing a return, we're seeing a return. And and that was a transition as well. Cause that started off, you know, really good for us. And that's what stone road was founded on. And then we found ourselves bashing our head against the wall for two to three years when that's kind of stopped working. Yeah. And then we ultimately made a a big transition to now, you know, most of the, our clients, Bill, we're working with on a commission basis for, you know, e-commerce sales that we're working with them to drive. So it was mainly because I was tired and I'm sure you've got it from a sponsorship standpoint is like, I, I was tired of justifying deliverables that I wasn't even contracted for, you know, I was like, well, uh, I'm doing your social media management. What, you know, I understand sales are important, but like, you can't blame me for it. The secret there too, is just understanding that even if they're they're asking you for and they're paying for marketing services. What they need at the end of the day is sales. sales. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's it. That's yeah. that's where the industry and, and I would say everybody sort sort of needs to come back to is it's not about impressions. It's about the quality of the impressions yep. and how much of that translates to the bottom line. Yes. Right. It's not huge. And, and that's I think we get distracted with impressions and we lose track of the fact that the quality of the impression is more important than the impression itself. And the quality is, my point is like the MidwestWhiteTail.com impressions were way higher quality than the YouTube impressions. 100%. But we didn't get rewarded for that because the industry the industry could have kept, or at least our sponsors could have kept Midwest Whitetail off the other platforms if they would have said, hey, yes, we will pay you more or we will pay you the same amount and not worry about the total number of views like we're worrying about everybody else, Mm -hmm. then we wouldn't have branched out. So then if somebody wanted to watch Midwest Whitetail, they would have had to come to Mm MidwestWhitetail.com. And we would have retained that same ability 
to translate those views into sales for our sponsors. But people were, you know, and I'm no genius, but I feel like they missed that opportunity. They now just media that, man. We see that moved. as well. We yeah. see that because you have to get connected with the marketing guy at company X that also thinks that way, that also perceives that value. And it was few and far between. And they're tough to find, especially with a changing landscape. You know, that it's, it's hard to pinpoint. We've had to do that on our side. I mean, much like a Midwest whitetail, you know, Stone Road really was that kind of outdoor digital marketing for, for the industry. And, I'm, and I could remember sitting in pitch meetings seven years ago and I'd pitch them exactly what we're doing now. And they'd be like, so you're going to like manage my Facebook page? And I'm like, no, <laughs> man, no, that's not that. Like, I don't, I just want to sell stuff for you. And they're like, well, like we do that at retail. Like, what if you just make social posts? And I was like, all right, fine, we'll do that. But it, it, it still, evolved. Still today, Bill, we're in that. Yeah. In some cases, some people still are asking us for that. Yeah. And then, but it, at the end of the day and where our successful clients have, have, kind of fallen into is like, guys, I just want to sell stuff. I want to sell right. stuff. That's all and I care about. That's how Midwest Whitetail did so well financially. I mean, we, our sponsorships were, were pretty, pretty steep mm -hmm. and it's because we could easily, or they could easily show how their money spent with us translated into the bottom line yeah. because so much of what we did went through to direct sales on their websites. Exactly. Um, so now it's tougher because let's say you bring a Kubota or somebody like that in and they've got these agencies and mm -hmm. they don't know whether or not you're moving the needle because they got so many different places that mm -hmm. they're advertising. So they got to have all these analytics. Mm -hmm. It was so much more fun to work with the companies who could see the needle move. Yeah. You know, when you, ran, you know, let's say a little promo on, you know, your, the new pole saw from, you know, Hoyman, for yep. example, they would see the needle move. Yeah. Um, you know, that was a lot easier from a sponsorship standpoint to sell it and to maintain it. Then when you start getting into the purely analytics, hey, it's mm. all number driven, how many impressions did we get? Yeah. You know? Well, we, we um, saw that firsthand with Deer Grow. I think we did a sponsorship for one, mm -hmm. if not a few years. And mm -hmm. we certainly saw the needle move when we, when we did that. And it's easier that way, right? Because then I'm not barking up your tree to say, hey, Bill, like I need more impressions. Like I'm seeing sales happen. I, there's a, yeah. there's a return there for me, you know? And right. it, it's, it's a hard thing, I think at the end of the day, because you know, uh, a, there's so many different hands in the cookie jar that like when we get our hands wrapped around something and we can control the measurement capabilities and we can control the people we work with from a content angle and all of that aligns, everybody's lives easier because everybody's benefiting from us seeing the sales happening. I don't have somebody say, Hey, is this person worth the sponsorship? I'm like, yeah, you should probably be paying them more, you know? Right. And yeah, and I only had one. I had actually one sponsor actually call me, believe it or not, and say, can we pay you twice as much? And I wonder if they feared that? losing you because they knew yeah. how much you contributed to the business. That's right. And then because of the direct sale. Yep. And, and that's the part that, that um, as time went on, we saw less and less of maximization. Early on with Midwest White Tail, everybody saw the needle move. Yep. And then little by little, what they saw was impressions, you know, because the, we got driven in that direction. So creating some kind of a focal point where all the content funnels back to one place where the sales take place, and then the, the people who are, you know, investing in that can see that needle move. Yep. I mean, that's, I don't, I don't have the energy to do it, but there's an opportunity there too. But, so, no, there's um, a lesson in that for all, you know, marketers or content creators is that, you know, I think we've done this even in the past is thinking that just all we need is content, like content, mm -hmm. is just gonna, but it has to really be, you know, quality and, you know, people have to see it. You can make the greatest piece of content in the world. And, and Bill, you and I know this firsthand and, and it, no knock to Cabela's, right? We put in a lot of effort when we were doing this wildlife and land management division around the tractors and food plot seed and everything. We, we would spend a ton of time on Bill's property filming this content. They throw it on YouTube, get a hundred views and be like, yeah, that was great. And I'm like, are you <laughs> kidding me? Like, what, what are we doing here, guys? Like you, you got, you have Cabela's as a platform like, and that literally was when uh, Stone Road seeded in my head because I'm working with one of the biggest retailers in the space. They throw it on YouTube and get a hundred views and they're like, oh yeah, it was great. And I'm like, no, 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 this is not good. This yeah. is, this is a fail in my book. We need to do better yeah. than this. You well, know? and then the, the, really the, the one that opened my eyes the most was the Spring Thunder yep. the Turkey series and Cabela's had complete control of that. There were no other sponsors. It was Cabela's Spring Thunder. So everything that happened on there linked back to their retail pages. 
and they could track that. And they told me how much turkey gear that sold. And I'm like, I shook my head. It's like, if we can sell that much turkey gear, yes. how much white tail gear can we, 100%. can we sell if we do something similar? Yep. And I just could not get, and, and, and again, it's not a knock against Cabela's, no. but there were so many different departments and so many different budgets. Couldn't do I would it. have these really, really top level meetings. I'd have nine, I'd have everybody short of, you know, the Cabela brothers themselves, you know, sitting there and, and everybody would nod their head. Mm-hmm. But then it was like, okay, whose budget is this going to come out of? And they're like, well, not mine. Not mine. Yeah. <laughs> not mine. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I look at that bill from a standpoint when you, when you see that kind of success and, and you're right from a white tail content, I, I thought in this, you know, I had no pull in it. Right. I thought that when Bass Pro made that acquisition, that they could have turned Cabela's into the modern catalog. Cabela's started as a catalog. That's how they got their start. Mm-hmm. Take it to the modern catalog, meaning get rid of the retail stores, make it the outdoor online e-commerce store, right? Keep Bass Pro as your retail destination. Make Cabela's the online to battle Amazon because who else is going to do it, right? And when that model didn't happen, it was like, man, I feel like that was a huge mess. There was an opportunity yeah. waiting to happen. It was the, it is, in my opinion, still the future. Online e-commerce is the future of hunting sales, fishing sales. Oh, for sure. sales. It's the future of everything now. Yep. I mean, gosh, the pandemic showed that. I mean, nobody, nobody wants to go to a store anymore if they don't have to. I mean, I think people do it socially just to get out and see other people and, you know, nod their heads and say yeah. hello. But, um, you know, I don't, I bet you Five percent of my total purchases are in, you know, through brick and mortar. 100%. The other ninety-five percent are online. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it's everything. It is. It's everything. Dog it's convenience. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, everything. It just, yeah. I mean, running shoes. Like I, I know what running shoes I want. I just buy them online. Like I, I mean, just, dude, literally. The, these pants, we were shed hunting the other day and I was like, Jeremy, I like those pants. What are those? He's like, sent me a link. I bought them right there. They showed up at my house yesterday. Done. Yeah, I mean, that's just what it they is. Perfectly like, and. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. And, and I feel like, again, in our industry, it, it's getting better. Like, and, and I, I mean, this is where I get tired, man. I've, I've been on that front line for a, almost a decade now, just beating this e-commerce thing, you know, and I feel like we're finally making ground on it. And we have some great clients that are forging and, and even competitors to our clients who are forging in that. But it's just like, I'm exhausted from it. Like it, it's, and it, I feel like we've shown so much data where it's like, guys, like, why, why not? And I get it. It's the fear of change and the fear of being different and and the fear of stepping on a retailer's front. And there's a balance there, though, because if I'm pushing an e-commerce self, I'm really pushing it. I'm also pushing a direct uh, retailer sale as well. Like somebody could walk into a Bass Pro and go buy that thing because they saw my Mm -hmm. my ad and my content for it. And it and it's a happy balance. And those who are realizing it and embracing it man, you're never going to catch them. They're going to be gone and they're going to, they're going to gobble up everybody else who's been resistant to it. You know, and that's why we see these conglomerates forming more and more. Yeah. I I still feel like, and maybe those guys are doing it by necessity, but there needs to be some kind of a outdoor industry marketplace. That's, that's, uh, gets them closer to their direct sale margin. Mm -hmm. Um, whatever that is, because that's the only way that some of these companies are going to do well, thrive, survive, whatever they they can't make it on the amazon.com margins. No, um, no. And they can't, because, honestly, they can't make it on a lot of the big box guys who are looking for 50 points, you know, and yeah. they're, they've got 30, 35 in cost. They're sitting there netting 20 or less. Like, it's just not, you know, at the end of the day, your, your top line looks great, but there's nothing flowing to the bottom line. Yeah. And you know, here's a classic example. And you're going to get a kick out of this and I'm, I'll probably, probably bolt and, and, uh, get going again here in, in my office, but, you know, John Barsotti with Rigid Forage. Yep. When he first started sponsoring Midwest Whitetail, he was in every store, you know, beating the bushes, making, you know, sales calls in every archery shop he could find, every, you know, all the big boxes. Then little by little, you know, his online sales start to take off little by little, little by little. Now, um, you know, I don't think John has any, maybe a few old, you know, relationships that are still selling his stuff through a brick and mortar outlet he just sells everything directly online full margin yeah and and his volume total volume of sales i'm sure continues to increase but obviously you know the the profit per sale is so much better Mm -hmm. you know so that that one to me is like a perfect example of of how some companies have done really well with that model and he he took that risk little by little of dropping out of Mm-hmm. you know, the, the brick and mortar sales, mm-hmm. but it really paid off for him. And now, I mean, 
he doesn't have any expense, hardly at all marketing expense. You know, he doesn't have to run all over the countryside trying to find people. So I feel like that's the future for the smaller companies like his yep. is you've got to have, you've got to be really good online because yep. you can't keep up with the big guys, you know, going into those places where the margins are so low. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's a, I think it's a good lesson overall for people to understand, you know, yourself is you're a limited resource, right? And so whether we're talking about you and, and, and where you got to your maximum point with a Midwest whitetail and how much resource you had personally invested, you know, or a company like John's to where it's like, you know, I can keep hiring people, but the margin's not there, right? The money's not there at the end of the day. You just got to figure out where your balance is in life overall, you know, and, and the people that continue to pour more and more into their business at some point, and, and I hit this point not too long ago where I'm like, there's a work life balance, right? Where I, I love what I do, which is so important in life. When you're working, if you don't love what you do, make a change. Like I, you, you have to, because it's just wearing on you mentally. But at the end of the day, even if you love to do that, like there's something outside of that. And if you don't embrace it, you're, you're missing out, you know? Yeah, for sure. So I, I mean, maybe that's where we wrap up is, is maybe my, <clears throat> my story now is one of, you know, of, of reaching that point, you know, that maybe we all eventually do somewhere along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, no, I, I, you know, all, overall, uh, it's been quite an interesting journey, you know, and I'm certainly not done. Oh, you, know, you got more in the thing. tank, Bill. I know yeah, a little bit more. <laughs> I'm, I'm not on E. I mean, not maybe on it's <laughs> Uh, maybe there's, you know, I'm not on fumes, but maybe I'm closing in on E. There's hybrid way. now, man. You just got to plug in, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm electric. I gotta, I gotta get my, uh, no. But no, uh, yeah, so I'm probably going to take off unless you guys have anything else. No, man, morning, we you know? we super appreciate your time this morning. I mean, uh, again, I, I love these kind of conversations where we don't we don't have any structure. I mean, it's just you know, where does this, this conversation and path take us? And, and really, I think for, there will be people listening to this and we're definitely going to push this thing. And I think they'll find it interesting. You know, I I guess the hammer home point is like, if they want to continue to engage with Bill, it's at billwinky.com, right? That's where we're, we're driving these people to. Yeah. I think that's the easiest point because again, like we talked about, it's one that I can completely control and, and, you know, it's easy to, for me to, to, you know, to work within that platform rather than having 50 of them, you know? Awesome. Well, and I hope, uh, seriously, man, let us know how we can help you on the audio front. I think that would be uh, uh, for us. I mean, Jared and I would tune in, uh, but yeah, right. I think there's a lot of other people that would listen to that. And we are, I mean, with the podcast, we, we have all those touch points. We know how it works. It's pretty, honestly, it's pretty painless to set up and, and get running. So, you know, if we can help you get that set up, we'd be happy to. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And I'll see where it, where it <clears throat> excuse me, where it all takes me, but that's kind of my master plan now is to go with, uh, less video, more audio and just supplement, you know, maybe it's, we'll see what that turns into. Awesome, man. Well, we'll let you get back to, to life after Midwest whitetail, you know, whatever that may be. Uh, how's your yard look? You got to mow it today? <laughs> no, I, I do need to mow. Look out the window here. <laughs> well, uh, I, I didn't want to be that guy. I, I know, guy I know. <laughs> well, uh, make sure you tell Pam and the kids, I said, hi, um, appreciate you taking time, man. We need to, we need to catch up more offline and, and talk life at some point. And just honored actually that you would give us the time. We really appreciate it. No, it's been my pleasure guys. Thanks and good luck. And, and we'll stay in contact. All right, buddy. Thank we'll you, see Bill. you, Bill. Thank you, man. Yeah. So now, man, uh, obviously, you know, Bill's a, a, a good friend of mine. I, uh, it's crazy to think that like, I remember him being in an, an idol and he still is, he's a mentor. He's an idol of mine. Like from not only a hunting standpoint, like this is the guy that I've watched and I know you have to um, hunt for so long, but um, I'm glad we kind of went down some of the path of business because a lot of what we've done at Stone Road Media, you know, Bill and I have had discussions and I, and, and we've both been through learning points and pain points in our, in our own lives and businesses. That- I don't know if he realizes really how, in tune we are to that because it's like for him to say you know giving away he's not i mean because we don't talk about we we get it yeah we don't talk about that kind of stuff but it but when you when you see a guy i mean listen at the end of the day bill winky is an entrepreneur he's a leader he's a founder he's a trailblazer in our community and um you know i i kind of put myself in that place and that i i've been there with stone road you know we've been there from the start of of having to do that same thing in in a different pathway but 
you know, ultimately we're about to converge here to where it's like, Hey, look, without content, we don't sell via e-commerce without e-commerce content's not as valuable. Um, and it's kind of a weird, r- weird place to be in. It's really awesome to see him at the end of Midwest Whitetail still with some gas in the tank. Like oh, he, he's got he's plenty. Not old by any you. means, but yeah, he's clearly still, he's hungry. I, uh, to be honest, and I'll, I'll put this on the record is that I think that in, in the next year or two, you're going to see something come from Bill, whether it's himself or, or him puppeteering things behind the scenes, because I know Bill as an entrepreneur, I know I, I was with him in some of those final years of Midwest Whitetail. And I could tell like, he's just tired, you know, like he said, you, you just get burnt to a point. But I know that also, uh, this reset that he's now taken He's got something up his sleeve, and, and we're going to see it, whether it's BillWinky.com or whether it's something else that he's involved in. He ain't done yet. You know, it's coming. And I, and obviously, this guy's going to kill several booners here in the near future, too. Um, Hopefully, we can just be in the same state as him next year. Well, listen, at the end of the day, it, may, it won't probably be this year because of where tags and stuff is. I'm going to get that guy to come on like a mule deer or some kind of hunt with us. Oh, dude, it sounds like there's an opportunity. You know, and hear that, Bill? Yeah. And, uh, you know, in exchange, we'll come hunt Iowa with you. Okay, Bill, I'll come, I'll come. <laughs> to you know, twist so his arm. Now? Uh, <laughs> so, but no, I think it, it, it's, uh, it's a really cool piece. I know this is, if you're at this end point, right? I don't know if you listen to this thing the whole way through or if you've divided it up into multiple pieces, but I know that's a long podcast, but this is one that, that I've been personally excited about. I know you have too, because this is a, you know, Bill has invested 30 plus years into this industry He's not done. Like he didn't just go away. There's more to come. And and I hope those people who have followed him around his career from writing to Midwest Whitetail, you know, are able to sink their teeth into this podcast and understand like where a guy like that's coming from. Because I know I've seen the comments, like people are like, Man, he just left them. He just left them. That's not how this goes. You have to understand it. You put so much into this thing. You're, you're talking to a guy's putting eighty plus hours a week into a business. At some point you're tired. You know, and you're exhausted. You can only do so much before, like Bill said it best, I felt like I was holding it back at some point. Um, But look at the impact. Look at the people that are in the industry. You and I, uh, uh, and Aaron and Greg and Zach and Hunting Public. Like, they're they're, the imprint that this guy has had on this industry in so many facets today and what it's become is because he said, I just want to be different. I want to be different than what's out there. And dream big. Can't end it any That's better than that, right? That's probably the best way to end the podcast is just say, always remember. Dream big. Always dream big. All right, guys. Bill Winky. We appreciate it. Thanks, Bill. Um, thanks for listening to the Hunter Podcast. Uh, I think probably just uh, you and I, maybe Weston next week, we're going to talk some food plots and stuff. But uh, a couple weeks coming up, um, Jeff Sturgis, Wait Till Habitat Solutions. Uh, we'll pull him in just like we pull Bill in. Another wealth of knowledge, different viewpoint. I'm really just, uh, excited mm-hmm. to dive in with Jeff on some things because I know he sees things a lot different. Yeah. Um, and kind of, again, one of those ones who's fallen into this digital side, you know, after a bill has kind of blazed through it. So, um, again, thanks for listening to Hunting Pod- Hunter Podcast. We appreciate it. And uh, we'll catch you next week. Later. It's take me. Oh.